Do we have some announcements to start? Yeah. Welcome, everybody, to Farm to Table. Thanks for coming out. It's great to see so many familiar faces. This is going to be a really fun weekend, uh, and the whole point of, of this is fun. Uh, fun from field grown material, fun getting in into a pot and, and onto a table and uh, to show. So we're going to start with a panel discussion this morning. Um, but first, before I do that, I want to thank all of our volunteers, our vendors, our, our board, everyone who helped to make this happen. So let's just give all those people a round of applause. <laughs> We'll introduce our presenters now. I have Matt Reel on the end, John Eads, Jonas Dupuy, Michael Hegedorn, and I'm Andrew Robson. Uh, and yeah, we're going to get started with a panel discussion. Um, I don't think we have any other announcements. Uh, oh, one that I thought of, uh, if you need to use the restroom, I believe there are three options. You go straight across the parking lot by the ballpark. I think there's restrooms over there. The Milwaukee Center, you can go inside. They also have water fountains if you need that. And then by the pavilion, there's there's also some uh, restrooms there. Um, yeah, let's uh, kick it off. Um, so, Jonas, why should we field grow? <laughs> let's break the ice. Okay. We'll start there. That's a great spot to start. Hello, everyone. Andrew and I yesterday thought, well, what might we want to talk about today? And one of the most obvious questions that came up is why field grow in the first place? The idea of the event is from farm to table, which would suggest that we're starting straight from the farm, and we have a lot of material that suggests that if you haven't already taken advantage. But we thought by going through why we would want to field grow in the first place, that can give you some ideas about where some of the pitfalls might be when growing and what some of the opportunities are when we're working on the trees as they come right out of the field. I summed up this in one word yesterday as we went through it. The primary reason to ground grow, other than it being fun, is speed. The alternatives are typically slower, meaning container grown. When you field grow something, it'll typically grow faster, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. John, you, you, you're pl in the middle of planting a, uh, <laughs> a farm of trees. <laughs> what's, what's the intent there? How's that going? Uh, it's going okay. Um, I think someone at the, there was someone yesterday that said, hey, I hear it's going well. Well, it's, I don't know if it's going well, but it's going. We're, we're mushing forward, you know. Uh, with the weather, I think everyone's dealing with the same kind of weather situation. Uh, you know, we had no no water in the summer, and now we have too much water. Uh, but we have about an acre and a half we're growing in. I've got about a third of that is set aside for container, and about two-thirds of that is set aside for in-grounds. Going to have a couple thousand trees, but we're just kind of getting going. I've got the trees I have uh, for sale. Some of them I've uh, been buying from other growers. There's a couple of people that have been retiring in the, in the nursery industry in, in the valley here. So... Some things we're uh, getting from other people, but then we're starting our own seeds. I've, I've started probably three or 4,000 seeds this spring, so just pushing out seeds. Uh, it's going to be a few years before we have anything like you're seeing around, but hopefully give us four or five years and you'll start seeing some stuff that's you know, moving in that direction. John, what's your spacing on your trees in the field? Uh, 18 inches. No, don't do 18 inches on center. Uh, six feet on center is what we're doing. Yeah, the question was how uh, spaced out are they, and I did six feet. I'm not sure. I think Telperia maybe did five or six, somewhere around in there. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also doing big walk paths, uh, so trying to give trees as much space as possible. One thing I'm doing differently, which will probably come around a bit later, is that I'm planning on going in the ground for a few years and then out of the ground for a few years to work on stuff, in the ground for a few years, out of the ground a few years. So I'm going to be cycling trees in and out of the ground a lot more often than I think a lot of growers tend to do in the United States. I think people tend to put it in the ground, do a bunch of work on it, put it in the ground for 10 years, and then figure out what's going on. So I'm going to do, I'm going to have a little more hands-on model where they're going in between the half acre on ground to the acre in ground and kind of like pushing my goals forward with branch size or whatever the deal is. Uh, so, so a lot more hands-on. Uh, and so that's why I'm trying to keep the, the grow operation fairly small. I mean, an acre and a half really is the size of this garden. Uh, maybe even a little smaller. So it's not it's not a big operation, um, but it's so the hope is to be a little more hands on with the trees. Yeah, let's let's do a little poll. Raise your hand if you have a bonsai that's not in a ceramic bonsai pot. <laughs> okay, awesome. Raise your hand if you have a bonsai that spent any time at all in the ground. Awesome. You can tell who signed up for this event. <laughs> <laughs> Marketing worked. Yeah. Marketing worked. 
Um, raise your hand if you have a tree from Telperion Farms, one of the growers that we're, we're celebrating. Awesome. Uh, Telperion tree in a pot. Ask that one. Telperion, yeah. Telperion tree in a pot. There we go. All right. The, the, the getting smaller and smaller numbers, but that's that's exciting. How many have shown um, a Telperion tree? There you go. <laughs> how many have shown, shown in an exhibit? How many, how many of you have shown in an exhibit a Telperion tree? Wow. Another <laughs> <laughs> one. Tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow, right. tomorrow counts as well. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All, right. All right. Last bit of feedback. A little more consistency on like, like three, three to four inches and like don't wander away from it. Okay. There we go. Thanks. Thank you. Breed is keeping us on track for everyone who's online, and thank you if you're online streaming this. Uh, or watching this on YouTube months later. Um, great. So, um, Matt, you have a lot of field-grown trees. Uh, what, what, you, you don't do a lot of growing in the ground yourself, but what are you excited about with your, your field-grown material? Uh, yeah, I have not grown... I wouldn't say I've grown any field-grown trees myself from scratch yet. Something I would like to dabble in in the future just for fun, probably, when I, when I have some space, or even with a little bit of space. I get some uh, decent sunlight, so I'll have fun with that. But for now, I have probably around 50 larger examples of Telperian pine and juniper, and uh, they've been they've been whole a bag full of surprises. Is what they've been. So a lot of them have had some things I wasn't so excited about in the beginning when I got to know them years ago, and then the more I worked on them, the more I was forced to to see something in their future and, you know, get more creative in some cases, uh, with, without, you know, having to, on the black pine, for example, you got to do a lot of wound healing and they're, they're good at doing that without taking forever. It'll still take quite a, you know, some years to do them in most cases, but, uh, that's pretty, pretty manageable and just getting them healthy. They, they really respond well and, 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 you know, like it's encouraging to see how quick that can happen on some of those, those cut, large cuts we see, because some of that happens the, thing we want to get away from is leaving them in the ground too long or having too many that we can't can't manage them all before they go to the branches get too thick or too long and they don't give you much workable future branching so that can be hard to work them back into a state where you're kind of having to start over but they they've you know back bud pretty well and things like that and you do cut back in stages start out with doing a lot of the root work and getting getting that old field soil out of that out of the root system. The co root core in stages seems to help the most with the health of the trees, so doing that sooner than later, as soon as you can, is good. And that's Those are my main, <laughs> have been my main observations on a lot of the, the conifer I've been working on from, from there. And yeah. a lot of them are just still long-term projects and pretty far off from being to any show-ready state. So it's, you'll yeah. see some over, over, over there under the tent that are just, I just cut them back and try to set them up for for some good future growth for yeah. that's more workable. And yeah, fun. We have a question. <clears throat> uh, can you expand on the root core development over stages and like timing? The root core development and stages over timing, yes. Yeah, more of a kind of a sectional bare rooting thing. So sometimes you just start with the bottom on a lot of these trees that are from Teleparian coming out of the root bags. They're pretty deep and have a lot of deep thick tap roots. So you, that's probably the best place to start uh, as long as there's some surface roots there already that you can safely that will sustain the tree uh, until they develop more new roots near the surface. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case thing. You kind of have to, if you are dealing with one out of a root bag or the ground, then you have to just see what the root lo roots look like first, like anything, get it, get it out of a pot. If you don't know what's already there and it's you know you have bare rooting to do, then uh, it's going to take some, I, usually, I try to do it in stages, but usually it takes two or three times to, to fully get good soil back into the core, and that can take you know over six or seven years Possibly, just depending on the tree and how the roots start out looking and what you have to work with. So it's all just kind of a relative. There's a lot of vari variables within that that you have to just kind of observe when you're doing the work. And you're the winner of a secret prize because we're actually doing an entire talk just on your question tomorrow. Tom Finsel is going to be sharing his results on different approaches, some alternative to the basic approaches that we've all done and the results he's had from that. So we're going to go into that in great detail tomorrow for Tom's talk. So huge um, promotion for please come and check out that talk. Yeah. Fun. Michael, uh, why do we need to grow trees? Why can't we just buy or, or collect trees from the mountain? Why, why grow? <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, that's a, that's a different question. Big, I was working off of these, uh, these first questions <laughs> this morning. Oh dear. Okay, here. Um, 
Uh, I feel like a, a bit of an outsider here, though I work with trees that were grown in the ground. I'm going to come to your question a little sideways. Um, I feel like a bit of a gadfly because I, <laughs> I, I, I'm really a, a, a container grown. Um, uh, at least that's the operation that I work with, although I uh, do have quite a few trees uh, in, the, in the garden that have started in the ground. One of the things that I would say about ground growing operations is that I, I see them done, uh, and this is uh, going to get me in a lot of hot water, but even in Japan, I, I, trees get away from people really, really easily when they're in the ground. There's a lot of momentum there. It's like a train uh, going downhill. And if you want to do it well, if you want to become even a micro grower where you got six trees in the ground, if you want to do what some of these growers are doing, that will involve a lot of touches. It's sort of like a soccer player. A good soccer player is going to have a lot of touches on the ball <laughs> in a game. Um, uh, through a season, you're going, to, you're going to want a growing season. You're going to want to touch it a few times a year. Um, and that's a lot of work. Uh, you can tend to forget about them. So I, I just want to throw out a little bit of a dark cloud uh, <laughs> over that. I, I think what, what John Eads just uh, uh, threw out there, this sort of hybrid model of having something in the ground, taking it out, working on it, putting it back in the ground, that's just about the best model. Model for for working with something that is going to have that kind of sort of horsepower <laughs> uh, to be able to create um, a structure on a tree a, the, the bones of the tree that you're going to be happy with when you when you come out um, your, your client Steve in Illinois does that right he does that's right and I, I he's almost one of the pioneers I think um, I think we were just sort of talking, hey, maybe you should try this, you know, 10 years ago. And he did it, and it was incredible results. Uh, I have some trees, if any of you want to see these things. Um, they're, they're pretty nice. i uh, got a few in the yard. But to answer Andrew's question, there's a lot of plants that, that we can't dig up in the mountains. If you like a lot of the, the traditional species, you're not going to buy a plane ticket, go to Japan, and, and dig it up over there. <laughs> you're going to grow it yourself. <laughs> Um, so, so that's one way we can fill out our, our, our quiver of species, you know, is, is, is to grow them, and, and, and the ground is a great way to begin. Um, and then, and then um, what we're talking about a lot here is, is this, uh, this transition from the field to the first pot, how that starts and what are the next, next steps after that. And, that and, and that's the beginning of the maturation of the tree. You'll find black pines developing more... Uh, more beautiful bark, um, the longer that they've grown in a pot. So not just the, the, the branches will you be developing, but there's some significant changes in the trunks as well. Um, and we'll be talking about trunk chops and things like that and how you manage all that stuff because it's different for all species and, and for different purposes. But oh, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> and, grafting. and grafting. Yeah, there you go, especially conifers. Does, does anyone actually have, I know a lot of people have pre bonsai grow material. Does anyone raise your hand if you actually have a tree in the ground right now that you're managing? Oh, cool! So we got we got people growing trees. That's, that's awesome. Jonas, what's next? To build on what to build on what Michael was saying, there are a lot of trade-offs between ground growing and container growing, and there are a lot of specific reasons why someone like John's going to say, "I'm going to dig these things up every few years and do that." All of this was summed up for me. I've been container growing trees for 28 years now. And I had this crazy idea that I'd put some in the ground. And a friend of mine was visiting from Japan, a well-known professional, Desaku Nomoto, a good friend of a number of us here. And he said, okay, okay, so if you put the tree in the ground, what are the odds you're going to be able to find the best front as you're working on it? And I said, yeah, you're right. That would be harder because I'd have to get down on the ground. And it, and it made me think of it. Notice how the experienced guys are nodding. <laughs> and it's difficult. And he said, okay, okay. And then he said, so let's see. When you're wiring the tree, you're going to have to lay down on the ground. And so, how effective is your wiring going to be if you're on your belly? And, oh wait, how far did you say apart you were going to plant these? How tall are you? To, how much space do you need in between? And I said, oh yeah, good point, good point. I can see why you'd want to really space those out. And ergonomically, laying on my, I don't know which side would be better, it may be challenging to get the wire on as effectively as you might were it in a container. This just went on and on. Well, you do realize that the wire is going to be cutting in in two to four weeks, that's right? A, Depending on the time of year. If it's in the ground, what are the odds that you're going to be able to catch the wire as it cuts in? Some wire scarring is fine in a young tree, depending on the species, the size, and the style you're going for. And I thought, yeah, you're right, that would be hard. I'd have to flag a tree if it's wired. But if I flag every tree in the garden, do those flags have meaning? 
and I could put Google reminders to email me. And so I said, yeah, good point. And seriously, this went on for 15 minutes. In other words, every single thing Michael said, if there's a thing you do to a bonsai, it will happen faster if you do it in the ground. And there's only, the, on the one hand, it's very simple. There's only one reason ever you're going to fail on any of those, and that is because you have too many trees in the ground. It is the only way you can possibly fail. Because if you miss pulling out the wire, it's because something distracted you. And if you have one tree in the ground and you didn't get to it, something distracted you. One is too many. If you weren't able to effectively manage the roots, that's because you had too many trees in the ground. Or you put them in the ground too soon. On and on and on. Yeah, that's it. So, some of us have a table but not a farm. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and ever since you wrote about Anuma, uh, yeah. I've sort of become obsessed with that. Yeah, so I'll summarize the question and by starting with the answer. The answer is yes. <laughs> For those who didn't hear the question, is uh, one way to frame it is, is there a middle ground? And that was actually the punchline of what Daisaku was getting at when we talked about that. He said, well, you're already growing trees and colanders. What if you put the colander on top of another colander? What if you put that colander on top of another colander? What if you put that on top of a big plastic or ceramic pot? Or what if that stack of colanders was set on the ground and you let that go into the ground. There are many different middle grounds and they're absolutely fantastic. The artist that Machik mentioned is Onuma is his name and uh, this is a guy in Japan who's probably one of the top growers of mini bonsai and he probably has several thousand trees that are all somehow crazy good quality. He's got a team of retired friends that come from all over Japan and help him work on these things. Yeah, and he grows them in 100% cinder or lava rock, and they have fantastic roots. Friends of mine have bought and repotted these trees in Japan, and they it works. So who would have thought that you could grow trees with decent-sized trunks in, a, in all deciduous species, Japanese maples, trident maples, and 100% lava? We'll get into substrate more. But to get back to the heart of your question, which is, is this a good middle ground? It is. And... Even in a single colander, I've seen colanders 14 inches across with a trunk 12 inches across in it. In a single colander. There is no excuse for needing to put something in the ground if you let the sacrifice branches grow long enough. However, it is a lot faster. And so one of the big topics we wanted to cover, which we can get to right now, is there's a lot of approaches for what we mean by ground growing, including these hybrid models, raised bed, stacked containers. And I think that's a great... Yeah. yeah, the raised bed is something I wanted to chat with you, touched on. Um, there was uh, something that some of you might have seen at Telperian Farms, um, which was a uh, brainstorm of Gary Wood, who we would be talking about frequently this weekend. Um, and it was, a, it was sort of a plywood raised area filled with pumice and Anderson flats with trees in them set on top of that. And this is sort of an idea that I think a number of us are touching on here is, is to find some way of frequently getting that tree onto a turntable. Otherwise, you're doing what I guess the, strange yeah. ergonomics. I was going to say something along, like, to all of this we're talking about, it's all about having more control, is how I think of it. So, if you, I like those bed ideas, but I still I think if you have Anderson flat on a, a huge bed of pumice, it's almost like having it in the ground. It can really get out exactly. of hand quickly, so if you and have... It can, that's right. There's so, still less control, is my point. That's yeah, all. That's right, and even, absolutely, even if you're using a raised bed, you're going to have to be touching these trees a lot. So if you have a single flush plant that you would, in a bonsai pot, be touching maybe once a year, you might have to touch it two or three times a year if it's in a raised bed or in the ground. So just to finish the, the thought with the raised bed and this, either a colander or an Anderson flat sitting on top of it, the roots are going to escape into the pumice. The pumice is really loose. You can kind of raise it and shake it a little bit, and the season's roots will come up. You cut them off, you put them on your bench, you work on it. You put them back again. 
you haven't really hurt the tree much. It feels like it's growing in a bigger pot. You do this with shohin too, you know, or little mame bonsai. You put them in uh, uh, beds where the, where the roots escape, and it feels like it's growing in a bigger pot. And you can do bonsai technique on them, <laughs> as opposed to them struggling along. So anyway, yeah, that's just yeah, he is doing something it. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it before it gets too too crazy. Something else in Machek's question you mentioned: Are there any thermal benefits to having the trees on the ground? And Yes, there are huge benefits, whether it's a collected tree just out of the ground, whether it's any of the things we're ground growing, even container growing trees, setting them on the ground instead of on a table, you're going to have massive benefits. We can hypothesize about what science is behind that, but I know from a practical matter, I've had hundreds of colander grown or some container grown pines sitting on benches, and they do well, and the greenest, healthiest, fastest growing trees in the garden are, the, are in the precise same soil, the exact same water fertilizer, everything, but they're sitting on the ground. And they're not even rooting in. But sitting on the ground, I think there's a little bit of additional moisture. I think it stays a little bit cooler down there. And the trees love it. And that's been true of every species I've tried that with, from crab apple to juniper to pine. In fact, we can make a really simple uh, sort of line there. If you want to grow your tree the fastest, you put it in the ground. If you want to grow it the next fastest, you put it on top of the ground. If you want to grow it the slowest, you put it on top of a bench. It doesn't matter what that's container right. it's in. John, you're you're in the process of putting a lot of trees in the ground, but you're doing the you're going to do the Telperion method where you're going to control it in the ground with a bag. Uh, speak to that, and you ordered a lot of these bags, so you, you yeah, that's right. Uh, so I had, and I totally forgot to bring them today, but I'll bring them tomorrow. I I uh, worked with a manufacturer in China to make uh, grow bags that are way thicker than what I see on the market, so they're a thicker. Um, so that the roots can't escape. We want some hair roots to escape, obviously, to get the benefit of getting moisture out of the and nutrient out of the soil around it. But I wanted a much thicker bag. So yeah, most of my uh, most of my seedlings are going into those, and then they can live in the hybrid model. They can live on the table in that bag, or they can go on the ground in that bag. Um, I will eventually probably move stuff over to, to Anderson Flats, uh, which is what a lot of people use. Uh, but yeah, most of my stuff is going into grow bags, and I have them, um, I call it a pint, but it's really about a coffee cup cozy size, uh, up to a five gallon. So, you know, my shohing trees are going into the little ones, and then they're going into a pumice bed nested down in there, and then they can easily come in and out. And then, yeah, up to five gallon that are going in the ground. So, so yeah, I've got kind of a different sizes of bags that I'm using for that. John, oh. do those trees go immediately from saplings into the bag, or do you grow them for a year or two and do root work before you put it in the bag? Yeah, absolutely do root work. That's I think that's key because once you get it in, once the you push the train over the cliff, then there's no help uh, with that. <laughs> Uh, and you may not be going straight down off the cliff, but if you're going over that edge, if you're putting it into the ground, it absolutely has to have at least one root touch, and I'm trying to do two root touches to really get those. And then I'm at every step I'm cooling, uh, which I think is big if you're growing. You know, Hopefully you're starting 100 so you can end up with four. Uh, so you're cooling as you go and say, okay, this, this root is not good, uh, this root's not good, these are going out the door, they're going to the club, they're going to the garbage, whatever they're happening to them. Uh, but so you're refining, you're you're sharpening that tip as you get into the ground, and then once it goes in the ground, the hope is that it at least has uh, a bent trunk and uh, root work done on it a few times. So with the with the thicker um, the thicker grow bag material, I guess your your theory there is that one of the benefits of the ground is that it's pulling water. Yeah, the idea, I think with all of the root control bags, the idea is that micro fine roots will escape out of the bag to pull in nutrient, but a, but not enough to get a big root out the bag. And obviously there's going to be bag failure and you're going to have it seams in places that there will be a big root get out. But the idea is that you've got some moisture transfer, nutrient transfer, warmth transfer that's happening through the side of the bag. I want to underscore what John was just talking about. Andrew, I think it was, uh, two, three weeks ago, asked, what's the number one problem you'd want to avoid with the ground growing? And I said, easy, roots. Just instantaneously, I never want to produce a tree with bad roots again because there's nothing that's harder or slower to fix. So this past winter, John and I had the opportunity to repot hundreds of young pines, anywhere between one year old and 
10 years old, say. And we learned a lot. And so having only done this for a few decades, it was as if it really felt like we had never done this before. We saw two flats of trees in two different soil. One flat was super healthy, and one flat was really weak and barely hanging in there. So we thought, well, these are obviously the keepers. We're going to cull all these. And then we repotted, which brings up the lava question. The pines growing in lava were twice as healthy and strong and vigorous as the ones not growing in lava, and they had the least amount of root division, which starts telling you that you need to solve for different problems. If your goal is big, we know high drainage frequent watering is going to deliver the fastest results. If you want to make small trees, have any of you ever measured the distance between the base of a trunk on a shohin pine and the side of the pot? Have any of you ever me measured the distance between the base of the trunk on a large tree and the size of the pot? Matt, how much space is there between the front of the pot and the base of the trunk on a large pine? Like, is it 12 inches, or is it like on a, two to more like inches? a more finished, like, on a coconut all tree. already in good soil yes. and, like, developed, yeah. Well, if it's for show, sometimes they use pots just for show that have less space, but if you can still get them in there without doing, taking too many roots off to keep the tree healthy, you know, for the show, and then we still have to, in some cases, re-repot those trees after the a show like Kokofu, which is in the, the winter, so... Uh, Sometimes there's very little space on certain points or sides, especially if it's a narrower pot to front and back. It just depends on the pot and the tree and the how much of a base it has and what kind of old surface roots it has and things like that. Uh, some can be pretty tight, but uh, they're not always meant to be like kept in there and kept growing in there for too long. And sometimes they are shown in those same pots that they grow in, and you want it to be a have enough space, but also not too much, like like with any in any stage of growing anything. I would say. So in other words, you can expect very little space if you ever want this tree to grow in a show pot. So have as much fun growing these big things, but by digging the trees up every few years like John's talking about, that's what's going to allow the tree to someday gracefully transition into a bonsai pot. It's very easy to get a big trunk if we let really large horizontal roots run. We're going to get the exact flare we want. We're going to get the most wonderful trunk that we could possibly want, and it will just not go into a bonsai pot. So, for a landscape tree, great, but you've got a lot of hard work. And so what John and I learned by repotting all these little trees is that we have very different criteria up front based on the size we want to grow, the speed we want to grow, and what kind of division we want, how close to the base of the trunk. Oh, bunch of questions. Okay. All right, let's cover questions. Uh, you, you had a question earlier. Thank you. Putting it on the ground, does it have to be on the ground, or can it be on wood chips or straw? Yes. <laughs> the question was, when you set a tree on the ground, does it have to be dirt, earth, or can it be straw, can it be bark, can it be anything else? Any of those are fine. And you'll find that as long as it's preserving moisture, that the roots are going to be able to benefit from that. Depending on what you use, you may not expect much, got to make eye contact sometimes, much root to escape <laughs> from that bag. Uh, if you put it into just plain dirt, that would also allow for it. But any of those approaches work, and I think we've all worked on trees that have been grown in a variety of those. I've dug trees from raised beds in perlite, raised beds in pumice. I've dug them straight out of the dirt. I've done dug lots of trees, and the roots always escape, and just depending on how fluffy it is, that's going to tell you how hard or easy it'll be to actually remove it when the time comes. Yeah, other question. Center aisle. <laughs> you, sir. Oh, yes. Mr. DeGroote. Oh, Mr. DeGroote. Hello. Hello. Uh, also, this is about the rotating issue. And I guess it has to do with uh, the length of each rotation. But my question is, when the trees are in the ground, it greatly accelerates trunk development, and it would greatly accelerate branch development, so or at least size, right? So if you're working when they're in a pot, not in the ground, to sort of get some branch development that you like, does putting it back in the earth uh, where the growth rate is accelerated a lot, do you have to worry about undoing some of what you did in the previous cycles when it was out of the earth? So I guess that would depend on the length of the cycles. Or, but I'm a little, uh, that's a question that popped into my head. Anyway. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll reframe the question. The question was, uh, so if you're pulling it out of the ground to do 
top work or potentially root work and then putting it back in, are you losing, by accelerating the train again off the cliff, are you losing that finer work? Uh, it's a really good question. I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's possible. It, it's possible. It, it, I mean, it might shock some of you that I have been in bonsai for less than four years, so I'm probably newer than many of you into this, uh, this wonderful craft. And With your root bags, though, probably not as likely. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah, the, the train will fall off the cliff a little slower in a root bag than it will just in the ground. Um, but I think the thing that I'm not looking for finished, uh, refined technique work, so I'm not doing micro wiring. I'm ultimately just trying to find a balance between, and we'll see some examples of some of these trees, uh, some of the stuff I've grown where the pine, the first bud is a foot and a half from the trunk, where I'm absolutely either going to have to cut that off or excruciatingly uh, work on uh, getting a graft in there to, to save that branch. So it's either a goner or I have to do a lot of work. And I think that there can be some technique that says... I'm going to save this branch, and I've seen, uh, especially some of the trees in Michael's yard that are in Anderson's on the ground in the back. They haven't been in the ground, but they're, you've got refined branches close in, and then escape branches coming off of that to girth up that refined sacrifice branch. Branches. Yeah, some sacrifices off of the branches. And so I think that you can, uh, yeah, cycle, I think you mentioned how often you do it, I think is a good question. If, if I put a refined tree in the ground, everyone knows this, that started out saying, ah, I want this tree to be bigger, I put it in the ground for four years, and then all of a sudden you have a yard tree. So you have to, like, find where that fine line is, and I honestly haven't found it yet, but I think it's a year or two that it's going into the ground. The, I think, so my, my thought is, uh, the first year it goes in the ground, it's sort of like learning that it's in the ground, the second year in the ground, it's teetering over the cliff, and the third year is when it goes. And so I've got to get it out of the ground before it goes. I can't pull it out too soon, or it hasn't gotten any of the benefit of being in the ground because it hasn't, you know, it hasn't grown into the soil at all. It hasn't, like, built up that momentum. The third year's good. But the third year is, like, if you don't get it out of there by the third year or the fourth year, then you're making new walkie, you know, potentially. Yeah. And actually, that might be... Part of the I know there's a couple other questions here. I just want to jump off this. Is one of the possible differences between ground growing versus pot growing, uh, or once you get it out of the ground, is uh, is that once you get it into an Anderson flat or some other large pot, and you're still developing some of the the, the detail. And I would say the detail don't even bother with it when 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 you're going in and out of the ground. You're you're just creating kind of inner structure, trunk and. And, and, and essential branching and, and, and uh, movement within that because you can't get movement later. But back to my point uh, regarding the, the timing, the, you, if you repot it one spring, that year, to John's point, it is reestablishing its root system. The second year, it's building wood and trunks and branches. And you should repot it the spring of the third year. Again, this is this is in the in the in the pot because what you want to continue, even though you're out of the ground, you want to continue the momentum of the tree. It's going to be a lower lower momentum, but after the third year, it's going to drop off, especially if you're dealing with something like a maple, because the maple is going to. Andrew and I were just talking about a maple. He repots every year. It's a really old tree, but it just gets so solid that if you tried to water it the second year, you would fail. I would just run off the <laughs> so. I want to get to roots at some point. I don't know if I should talk right now, but what we were talking about escape roots, and, and Jonas was talking about these large roots that grow out in the ground. And this is one of the largest problems with growing in the ground. With your trees, you have this problem. With your shrubs, you can have this problem. If you grow satsuki azalea, I would love to see some people grow some satsukis. <laughs> it's a really interesting plant. One thing you'll find is that it will grow a really big root in the ground. You take it out of the ground, you cut that root, you will never have a big root again. It's an interesting plant. The shrub. You do that with the Japanese maple, you might get some really big roots. You might get some really big roots with a pine. And there you, there you start to see the difference between pines and shrubs. Um, but controlling those big roots is essential. Um, and you might want to keep an eye on that if you're growing in the ground, because then you can get a really big branch growing off one side of the tree. If you've got a big root below it, there's, there's quite a bit of continuity there. But keep an eye on those things, too. Even just trimming back hard branches that are shooting out where you can see there you don't have to do the root work that's one way of controlling that root let's let's go through some other questions yeah uh, Jonas says you know you commented you had to, when you did all that repotting the strong trees and the weak trees I presume the weak trees had what you would consider better roots and if so what type of soil were they in 
The question is, how should I grow trees? <laughs> well, no, that's your experience on that. I mean, you know. So to follow up on what we were talking about, what kind of soils produce what kind of roots? And very specifically, we were comparing a batch of trees that was in 30% Akadama and the rest pumice, or, and also some were maybe 80% pumice with 20% mulch on the one hand, and then we had 100% lava on the other hand. Lava produced the better results in terms of overall growth and health. The trees that were weak, sickly, but had well-dividing roots were in the Akadama. And so the trick that we want to do is have more smaller particles near the surface and or different materials near the surface where your surface roots are and larger, much coarser than we would expect particles down below. I would say, from what we were talking about earlier in terms of the quality of the roots, the number one thing to do to get good field-grown roots, delay putting it in the ground. John talked about taking at least two years to get them in the ground in a lot of cases. The most magical thinking, and this is proof that all of us believe in fairies, gnomes, and whatnot, I'm going to put flawed roots in the ground, but when I dig it up, it's going to magically be amazing. I saw it on the YouTubes, and it, I have yet to see that. I hold out faith that it's possible, but I know that we can really hedge against the stark reality of the magical thinking and just take more time. And so I'm waiting two, three, four, five years before I do the massive growing because if any tree has anything short of all the roots all the way around that I need based on that species, I'm wasting my time by putting it in the ground sooner. There are exceptions. Anything you can air layer. Just do the air layer. Speaking of air layer, now Tokutake, who's vending back there, um, when you go up to him, ask him to show you, uh, I'm, I'm volunteering him for this, but <laughs> ask, ask him to show you photos of his uh, ground layers. So he'll take a tree that has completely you know, what we'd call horrible roots by traditional standards, uh, and he'll just hit the reset button. And he'll, he'll do a ground layer, he'll put cement around it so we don't have roots growing, uh, just a, a quick set cement around it, uh, around the trunk. He'll, he'll do the incision above that, uh, and he'll get a, you know, 360 degree radial root pattern, cut it off, goes in a pot. Uh, and he's had tremendous success with that. So even if you do things wrong, uh, or, or things don't go the way you planned, or something escapes or gets away from you, there's techniques and tools that we can use to bring it back. Um, they take time away, which is what we're trying to avoid, but there's a way to reset. Is that deciduous only, or are you doing conifers? More like deciduous, no. Not the pine. Yeah. I'm, talk, I'm talking more deciduous, but I will say um, the, the black pine uh, right at the end of the tent behind the water jug, it's in a big plastic crate. Uh, that was a cutting. Uh, it was a, it's a Talpirion tree. Um, I wasn't happy with the, the roots, so I did a flat cut. And one thing you'll learn with field grown materials is it will never be as strong as when it comes right out of the ground the first time. And that's when, for pruning, for repotting, that's when you need to take the biggest risk um, and, 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 and uh, have your, your chance for success will be much higher. So that tree, uh, the black pine, it's, it's a trunk about eight inches in diameter at least, maybe a little larger at the base. Uh, that was a total cutting. It had no roots, uh, but I did it right when it came out of the ground. I did it. Uh, it went in a greenhouse, went on a heat pad to just give it a little bit more chance of success. I'm not saying go and take eight-inch black pine cuttings, but uh, <laughs> but there are tools that we can use. Make it a foot. Uh, yeah, there are tools. We'll that we can one use. Like that. I want to make one comment, which is a little to the side about Yamadori. Uh, which I've noticed, which is if you if you dig up uh, a conifer, particularly in the pines and spruce and whatnot, and you pot it up, uh, very often uh, you'll see a, a ridiculous amount of budding in the first two to three years. Then after that, that budding fades off. And there, there might be something going on here, but I think it's because particularly trees in the Rockies, the root system is so limited, and you put it into a box of pumice or lava or something like that, and it just goes nuts filling up that box with roots and the, 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 the basic response to a, a tree that has lots of roots is to balance that with lots of buds that will then balance that. So anyway, I, I don't know how that links here, but there's something, something about what you're saying about that cutting made me think about how those old trees respond. Yeah, and I, I, I not noticed just not just with roots and the power to create new roots. You know, I have about five trees, deciduous conifers, like I did that with, you know, huge trunks. My biggest trunk in the garden is a Dawn Redwood that was a cutting. It's probably a good foot in diameter. Um, but, but not just with roots, you have good opportunity. Um, 
to, to really turn back hard and, and have a, be, these shoes have a lot of stored energy when we first take them out of the ground. And that's the reason that we can take so many chances and risks. Um, but you can do it with pruning, and maybe we'll transition more towards pruning. Um, for deciduous trees, if, if you grow something that's, that's crazy uh, and it's, it's wild, uh, and let's say you were just growing a trunk and, and maybe it got away from you, it's 13, 14, 15 feet tall, you can just chop it back to, to little stubs. You'll get a bunch of sprouts and you design your tree from there. And that's, uh, if anyone ever has the chance to come by my garden, which we're, we're open and, and just send me an email, you're, you're more than welcome. Um, you'll see most of the, the field grown deciduous trees, I have about, I have about 80 of them. Um, they were all cut back incredibly hard and I'm designing the tree uh, from the regrowth. You see this with deciduous Yamadori. The best deciduous Yamadori in the world right now is in Croatia with people like Maria Hadek, who, who did a club presentation for us uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, and what they do, right when they collect the trees out of the ground, they cut them back, you know, they cut back 90% of the branches off back to these short little stubby trunks. They bare root them, they prune the roots back, they're cutting it back almost to nothing, both trunk, uh, branching, and roots. Uh, they put it in a pot, and it has this explosive response. All that stored energy is released. Uh, it rebuilds a root system, it, and, and you start getting sprouts and, and, and uh, branching to start designing the rest of the tree. So there's a lot of potential right when you get something out of the ground with stored energy that we can really take advantage of if, if you, you know a few tricks. Uh, one thing that, uh, that we can uh, distinguish there, jumping off of Andrew's uh, conversation here, is that uh, you will see an awful lot of that stored energy with deciduous trees. They store more energy. In, in the winter, it's going to be starches. When the, when the weather warms up, that's going to turn into sugars. It's going gonna, it's gonna to explode. Conifers don't store quite so much. Um, so it depends on what kind of a conifer we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, like the redwood that you have in your yard, that was a cutting. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's deciduous amazing. Deciduous conifer. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Um, but um, uh, where was I going with that? Uh, stored, energy stored energy. Yeah, conifers. And then the cutback. So one thing uh, that I think is a little bit of a misunderstood often is how we cut back. So, uh, so getting into the weeds of cutting back a little bit. Um, it, it's very tempting to make these cutbacks really close to the, to, to the new leader, perhaps, and to cut it at an angle. I don't recommend this because you can very easily get dieback on the lee side of that. The larger your extension that you're cutting back to, the longer the stub you want to leave. Sometimes that's inches. And cut it straight. The first cut should be straight, and that, that, that protects that other side. So you have a branch coming off here, your trunk is here, um, and then uh, there's hopefully some, some buds over here that will come out and will allow you to have a, a side branch, perhaps. Uh, but then later, one, th one thing you'll notice is that although the, the branch that you're turning into a new leader, you'll see a little collar there. Once that begins growing, after a year or two, you're going to notice that the collar migrates. And it goes over to where the stub is, and it starts to belly up there. You're going to see a little ridge form. That's when you cut that down at an angle, and you hollow it out if, if there's any kind of a concavity that you need to do, and then it'll start closing over. <laughs> uh, I just have a quick question about that. So if you're leaving, I, I understand the general concept of leaving stubs depending on the, the size of the branch and how hard you're cutting you know, back depending on where it is and what, what not. So if, it's, if it is an initial stub and you're leaving it long enough, does it matter whether you cut it at an angle or make it a flat cut during that time as long as you leave a good enough stub? Good, Knowing yeah, you're going to cut it, it back again it later? It doesn't matter if it's six inches long. <laughs> no, I mean the, the angled cut opposed to the flat right. one. For that initial right. cut, does that really matter whether it's angled if, or flat? If, if it's six saying? inches, if the stub is six inches long, it doesn't matter. For that time. And leave stubs. It's really easy. Always leave more of a stub than you think. You can always carve it down later. But it's true. It's probably the number one problem with the cuts is that they're made too close. Here's the number two problem with the cuts, and the one that works me the most working with conifers a lot more than the deciduous. When you cut with the deciduous, you're likely to get buds. They may not be right where you want them, but you're going to get buds. With a conifer, what you're doing is you're deciding where the future sap flow is going to be in that area. And if you have a field-grown pine or juniper and you cut anything really large, bigger than two, three inches, you may have one branch you're cutting back to. So I've got a big trunk, there's a big branch here, hey, I'm going to cut that off. Well, I'm never going to have a branch on that other side because I just killed the sap flow in that entire side of the branch. If you're going to graft, graft before you do that big cut. <coughs> if you're growing a juniper, maybe trace that lifeline down to the roots. 
I have actually worked on field-grown trees that were gorgeous, beautiful trees. And a large cut was made on one of the branches, and a large cut was made on one of the roots. Unfortunately, the remaining roots weren't connected to the remaining branches, and the tree died, and so 15 years down the drain. These are subtle points, but... Yeah, Nat's point is very subtle. Do you need to worry about the angle of ways out? If it's a ways out, not necessarily. But do you want to make that cut at all if you need sap flow in that space to graft, to expect a bud later on, or to preserve a root or a lifeline? Along that line with the, the hard cutback, uh, I mean, it obviously starts with having a really healthy tree before you do that. That's the main thing. And then, then you got to, you know, decide, depending on what species it is, how hard can I cut it back and how much at one time, depending on all that. So I've... What, to Jonas's point, like, yeah, sometimes you're, you're making a hard cut and you may end up killing the, that side of the branch off back to a certain point. But more often than not, I've seen the hard cut back that I've done on a lot of black pine at least and things that don't even, you wouldn't expect to back bud that well on an older trunk or branch. But uh, if anything, like, I've noticed them coming from the bases of those branches, which need to be redone anyway. So sometimes there's benefits to, like, knowing you can kind of predict that that's going to happen sometimes, but you're okay with it knowing you have more further back in to, to regrow the tree. And if you don't, sometimes I'll just take the risk and, and make a cut, even though even if I feel like it's being a little too aggressive, sometimes I'll experiment a little bit if I already have built up energy in the tree, repotted it, or done something to, to get it healthy enough to make that decision. Yeah. So it's a really, it really is a case-by-case -case type thing. You have to really assess each tree and know about each species, too. The more you do, the more it'll help to make those decisions. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting the difference between deciduous and conifer because uh, in deciduous, wherever you cut, you're going to get buds more frequently where you make that cut. So you don't, it, it, if you're cutting back to a, another branch, then yes, you need to leave a stub on a deciduous plant. But if you're just doing a, a trunk chop or, or just cutting back to generate, you know, just random buds closer in, where you cut, that's where the buds are going to be, or close to it. Still leave so stubs, though. Still you leave still stubs, leave a little yeah. bit of a stub, more, especially if there's more, a, yeah. a small branch there, a bud there the that you want to protect. The it is, usually the longer the stub I'm leaving. Right, the right. Yeah. But, but mostly where you cut, on a, if you trunk chop an elm, all of your buds are going to be right at that cut. And so uh, yeah. it's, it's a little, little different uh, between deciduous and conifers in that regard. So I, have a, I have a question for Michael. Oh, God. <laughs> How would you characterize the difference between American field-grown pines and Japanese container-grown pines? How would you characterize the difference? Because if we're clear on where we might want to end up, just because we have a certain pattern of trees doesn't mean we necessarily want that. If our goal is somewhere else, uh -oh, if we know maybe question. what the differences are, <laughs> what what do we do to get there? So, are you talking aesthetic differences? And we need you to name structure. names, too. Name names. Oh, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> So the structure, say branch, number of branches, branch distribution, size of branches in a container of field-grown Japanese tree versus your average field-grown American tree. Okay. Um, you know, honestly, I think you've been poking around in the fields in Japan more than I have. I, 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 did, I did a lot of, I was chained, remember. <laughs> I wasn't running around much. In any event, I will attempt an answer. Uh, what I have seen um, is is that the Japanese train their conifers the way that we, sh we are training our deciduous. <laughs> Meaning, uh, pe people like Peter T, I think, is really on the right path with this thing. In, 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 that, in the sense that he's, he's growing and leaving more branches than he ultimately needs. Um, and that was something that was corroborated. I was beginning to wonder about this thing, and I had a conversation with Jonas about this a few years ago, and I realized that Peter T. had been doing this for a while already. And it's a way of slowing down the tree a little bit in some way, which is a good idea if you're growing in the ground or you're growing in a big pot, you know, that transition that we're talking about here this weekend. Um, but, uh, but, but I just feel like um, the trees in Japan, the conifers, are, are simply a lot fuller, and they have a lot more options. Uh, than we have here, um, that, that we tend to have. And so I, my, my sense is that we tend to style or we try and imagine the tree a little too soon. Um, and and to, to, to leave more options later not only develops the tree faster, because you're leaving more branches on the tree, but it gives you options that you can't foresee, because things change over time. You know, sounds like a dumb statement. <laughs> but it's a real one, you know, that... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So I, that's true. I gotta say one thing because you leave too many options. As long as you're not leaving spoke wheels or too many options, that can be a pro real problem though. Like you don't want to leave too much. Like oh, yeah, either. It's, that's right. It can get, it, it's a fine right line. You can't leave too many. Exactly. They, <laughs> obviously, they like sometimes. Like I've I've worked on a lot of Telperian trees that obviously everybody knows they don't have the best branching. Uh, some have huge scars, but uh, you just sometimes you work with what you have and try to improve it. That's kind of kind of where my like a lot of my experience comes in though. So if I in a perfect world you you grow them correctly to begin with and you have all those options, good options I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something I've really enjoyed with field grown material is. Um, it's, it's, it's really changed preconceived notions. I always thought if you're growing a tree that it has to be a perfect looking bonsai, you need to know what you're starting with. And I find that a lot of the field grown material that I've worked on, uh, it's wonderfully unique. Uh, and it almost feels more like Yamadori work. So just because it's coming out of a field, um, it might have reverse tapers or maybe some things went wrong or there's some things that are crazy, but trying to take that craziness if it's old, if it's big, if it's interesting, um, and trying to utilize that to your best advantage. I feel like a lot of the field grown trees that I play with are, are more Yamadori than they are um, than they are highly trained bonsai. And, and that's a fun challenge because I think that will make the trees as we as now they're out of the ground and now uh, they're getting more um, time based techniques and, and, and intensive care. I think you end up with a really unique starting point, and then it doesn't look so homogenous than if we say, I'm going to make a formal upright, or I'm going to make a very you know, sumo trunk tree. I get a really unique start, maybe because some things went wrong, maybe because, I don't know, half the tree died, maybe because, I don't know, other things happen, life happens. But if you have a really uniqueness built into the material, and then you put nice traditional work on top of that, it feels more unique. You know, if, if we're talking deciduous bonsai, how many of you have ever seen a deciduous bonsai with a name? Um, we don't tend to name, or the Japanese don't tend to name deciduous trees because they all look very similar. But Yamadori conifers get named because they're very individualized. And so if you have something that's got a lot of funk and you're able to put real delicate work on it, it I think it creates nice variety to a garden. And that's what I've been really excited about with some field grown material. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make one point that, of, of uh, something that we started with, you know, why field grow if you, know, you dig things up in the wild? Um, and one, can you hear this? Is this fine? Yeah, it is. Okay, I'm just talking quietly. Uh, one thing that uh, was driven home to me recently in my adventures with uh, some of the collectors in the states, like uh, uh, Steve Arlen, Dan Vederick, uh, uh and others, uh, is that they, if you talk with them. They often say, uh, and this is of interest to anybody who's interested in really small trees, <laughs> how rarely they find any tree of quality of Shohin size. They will find two or three a year, and they're out there every weekend. So if you want you know, a Shohin juniper or something like that, um, the only way you're going to get it is to do what, what we're talking about up here, some kind of pot growing, field growing. Machek. I'm sorry, they're, 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 they're what? They're messed up by gravel or whatever, just being next to the road, being a permit tree in the, in the Mountain National Forest. Like young, uh, seedling in the ground in the wild is like a quality. It's a thousand times better than the seedling you're going to get from Isley. There are a lot of, <laughs> a lot of seedlings. Gotcha. Dependable, dependable We're talking right. about different things. I'm talking about the trees locked in the rocks, up in the rocky breaks. Oh, it's right. almost impossible to find those. Of, of small size. Yeah, well, Michael's I'm saying if, if you want a big. certain variety of a small tree, you can't find those in nature anyway here. if it's not, And neither can they in Japan. It's rare to find a small collected tree in Japan, even when they were collecting a lot of trees, I heard. They're rare anywhere for a collected tree. So the best way to replicate that is by it's the... a small tree comment. Start, you know, start, start growing them the right way and start... All the things we're talking about, just applying those and staying on top of it will get you those results. See, yeah. it's, a, it's a chaos qualified seedling though. It's something to start yeah, with yeah. where you can start it. Yeah, you, so I remember you and John just got a bunch of alders, which are pretty fun. And, and those alders, they're growing in the forest floor, right? And they have all these little twists. Uh, they have all these little twists. They're growing in the forest floor. Um, I think what Michael's differing with you on is that with Yamadori, most of the growing work's done versus if you get something that has some real built-in interests, 
it's still going to take five or ten years to grow that into the Shoheen Lakes. But but yeah, those those alders that you guys found recently are a tremendous start. It's got all this little movement built in just because it's grown around moss and rocks and trying to. Yeah, don't tell anyone about the alders in the mountains because we we want them all. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody go collect alders. <laughs> No, uh, this is something that uh, Randy Knight told me a couple of years ago. He said, you know, if you're going to be growing trees, it would be interesting to just go in the mountains and get two or three-year-old seedlings because the, kind of, that interest has already kind of started. You don't have to start that interest. So I think a lot of people go to the mountains and try to find really nice trees. But there, there might be, you know, some interest in finding two or three-year-old seedlings with a break or a bend or whatever. You know, so yeah, yeah, Yamadori pre uh, Yeah, like exactly. Yamadori pre, <laughs> pre okay, that, that wasn't what I was talking about. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Um, I want to go back to a couple of comments ago, I think, uh, light a little fire. I think, um, so if you haven't noticed, the, the five of us are pretty good friends, and so I think we can kind of question each other. But I think one one thing that I would question, and this is kind of a pre-pre-question, is are we creating the kind of trees that we want to create because we're working with material we don't want to work with? Like, are we... It, like in a in a kitchen, I, I come from restaurant industry. In a kitchen, am I trying to make the best dish out of a piece of junk, or do I try to find the best piece of material and then do something with it? I, you know, we uh, we did pizza, and I can't say that I really had all that much skill, but I found tr I found food that was really good. I found purveyors that had really nice product. And then I just had to put them together and then people loved them because it was good product to start with. And so I think the question is, and this is nothing to say about anything that anyone's done, but like, are we creating, are we working with the material that we have to work with just because that's the material we have? Or are we trying to figure out how to create material that we really want to be working with? And... And I think the exciting thing is both ways can end up with amazing world-class bonsai. Yeah, uh, but the main point, why are we growing things? Because we're not satisfied with what's there. Why grow flaws into the tree? I'm, we satisfied. Are, I'm satisfied with some of the telparian flaws I have. And they're fantastic. But that, to John's point, we get to choose what the flaws are. We can tell you what to do with all the flaws. We can do that all day long, and we've got a lot of good tricks for that. <laughs> But it's more a test of our imagination when we're field growing or long-term growing. What do we want to end up with? And if we, it's really easy to grow things with flaws. It's fast, it's cheap, it's, we can do it all day long. If that's what we think the most beautiful end result is... These flaws weren't intentional either. Right, and so, again, test your imagination, see what to aim for. I think this is a lot harder than we give it credit for. I, 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 I we're about blocks, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Now, I was uh, trained in Japan, uh, and we worked with a lot of trees that were collected, um, and that was my background. Uh, some of those were field grown, but actually, very, very few of them. Um, and uh, so, when I came back to the states and started working with raw yamadori and whatnot, I knew the techniques to to bring them into focus as a bonsai. And you can do that if you have those techniques. You can do that in one day, and you can create something that looks pretty spectacular off of, to jump off of what John was saying, uh, of something that you're already really, really excited about. I, I just, I, anybody who wants to try this, growing in the ground, growing in a pot, growing into the future, imagining that future, I want to give you a pat on the back, because I think this is a lot harder than people uh, give it credit for. To John's point, you start with 100 trees and maybe four of them go into the ground of the banks. Well, I would say one of them comes out as, as a bonsai that we actually are interested in working with. I really think it's that hard. I, I hardly think that I have made six bonsai that I am excited about uh, from things that I served from nothing, and I've been doing this for many years. Uh, I mean, this is, this is really, really hard. It's hard to see in the future. So have many plants, have a lot to play with. I taught, tell this to every student, don't have three plants. Have 25, have more, have <laughs> because yeah. we're going to be and, learning. Yeah, just, yes, real quick, just real quick, I want to be clear that I'm not disparaging on any growers, you know, that are doing work. Obviously, I'm just getting going. I just, I'm just thinking, like, uh, we have a palate, uh, and back to the food analogy, we have a palate for certain foods, and do we have a palate for that food because we were forced to eat that food, or do we have a palate because that's really what we want to be eating? And it's like tr just trying to imagine what, what the future, what the work could be, and yeah, it's extremely hard uh, seeing you know people making that, making those transitions and figuring out. But like, 
how can we begin to think today as a as a group of us under this tent, like how, to move the move the project forward? You know, move the the whole industry forward a bit. I have a friend who is asking me why I had flaws in the trees I'd grown from scratch. <laughs> He was considering not believing a word I had to say about anything. He's three years into bonsai. I hope you're listening. Hello, if you are. And he developed an ins a very good eye very, very quickly. And it was a very fair question. My first answer that came to my mind, I didn't say it out loud, is what Michael just said. It's hard. I'm open and willing to share every flaw in every single tree I've ever made. And I'll tell you how you can avoid it. I'll tell you how I ended up with those flaws in my trees. It's just a fun part of what we're doing here. It is. It is. I, uh, one one comment about that is is something that, it, uh, having just said what I said, I want to retract it slightly. <laughs> in that, don't give up on trees too soon. Um, now this goes back to my pottery background. Uh, Sam's laughing. Yeah, you're a potter. We're gonna we're gonna be doing maybe. Agree on this. So, when you're making pots, you make you know a, a set of pots for a kiln. You got you know 50, 60 pots that are going in there, and there's a half a dozen of them that are honestly the worst things that you've ever made. Or at least that's your opinion. When they're greenware, after they come out of the fist firing, it feels the same, and then you glaze the thing, and there's still crap. And you, one thing I learned as a potter is that you fire everything. You put it in the kiln. You let the kiln have its say. And an embarrassing amount of the time, when it comes out of that kiln. Those are your favorite pots. <laughs> it's really a strange experience, but give give your young plants a try. If if they have some of these weird errors, sometimes those are ones that over time. I was beginning to, to raise that one in another another question that uh, that Aji that 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 savor that comes with time changes a lot of things. It can be bark development. It can be just a little bit more caliper. When you have a really quirky, kind of stupid looking tree, when it is a half inch thick. When it's four inches thick, a lot of things change. So don't necessarily give up on them if they don't look perfect. The other thing is if you're working... Here, let's do some questions. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick for the live stream to repeat that for the record. Uh, yeah, so Chris from Tupperion just said, and if you're going to grow out trees, start with batches. And they started with batches of 100, and then that would get weeded down to 80 that went into the ground, and then that probably got weeded down further. So just starting with one tree, you end up with disappointment. And he mentioned that you... Uh, you can't get your, your keep can't keep your hands off it, which I think is really true. You want to be messing with it. So have a try to figure out what that batch size is. If it's 15, 25, 10, 100, whatever that batch size is, so you, so you could do. And I think we, I've talked to all of these guys about this too. When you have a batch size, then if something happens, you can kind of get an idea of like, was that the weather? Was that me? Was that hard prune? Was that too not hard enough prune? You can kind of like be a little more scientific about it. If you have a hundred seedlings in front of you and you have 10 die, then you can say, oh, okay, those died because I cut them at the wrong time of year, those died, whatever. So, so yeah, you can kind of have a little more of a, an idea about uh, what's going on with your trees if you have a larger batch size. Yes. Yeah, so, so I noticed, like, most of us here are probably over 20 or so. <laughs> 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 I like the idea of trying to actually put out trees that are actually growing the growth process. And so I was wondering, as I, like, covered my neighbors with like, Japanese maples and whatnot, um, whether um, the idea of those back and then working on that with, with the goal of then air layering that, getting all the nice, you know, you know radio roots. Um, but 
but, but like breaking that process up rather than taking something from all the ground. John, I know John does a lot of this, uh, creating creating small trees on big trees and then air layering oh, them off, yeah. and then Jonas has done something. Like, much of it yeah. grows there first, that graphic grows, taking all the energy from the larger trees, and then... Use the big root system. system. Yeah. yeah. Andy's concerned he's too old to start things from seed, and wonders, can we start smaller trees on bigger trees by methods of layering? There are some species for which that is such a natural. I would say that most of the absolute best beach bonsai in Japan has all been started from air layer. And they were trunks, they were branches. That's true of so many deciduous species. And we all agree that that is an absolutely fantastic way to start. So yeah, That's doing some of the, the design work while it's on the tree, not just saying, hey, this is a branch I don't want, I might as well. Yeah, and depending on the form you're going for, you may or may not need to do that design work up front, but if you do know, I want a wrapped style, find that branch that has a lot of branches growing upward. If you want to make it a single informal trunk, then you can put that movement into it as you're developing. And if the tree's in the ground, you're going to get that rapid growth, and then you air layer it off at whatever precise angle you want to play with. We have a question yeah. from a 20-year-old over here. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, so my question is similar. Um, like, to what degree can field growing and air layering be married, um, especially with deciduous trees? Obviously, with conifers, you put one tree in the ground, you get one bonsai. Or maybe you put 40 trees in the ground, you get one bonsai. With deciduous, are you putting one tree in the ground to get one bonsai? Are you putting one tree in the ground to get five bonsai? Are you putting one tree in the ground to get a hundred bonsai? Yes. Or should you have just started <laughs> yeah, with a right. hundred trees in the ground? Yes. yes. Repeat it. Uh, okay, the repeat for the uh, for the record is, the question is, uh, with can we marry ground growing and uh, propagating air layering uh, from trees? Uh, and what species does that work with? If you're growing, uh, you know, conifers, I think, is one. You put one plant in the ground, you end up with one tree, although... So. Junipers. Oh, juni okay, junipers. This is pines. actually junipers. You can do pines as well. Uh, younger, but, uh, but, yeah, with deciduous, uh, I mean, for my own growing operation, I've got... I'm... Right now, I'm growing a lot of things from seeds, but my I hope to taper that away almost all the way with with uh, maples, especially, and only tr do air layers because um, I can get a lot more age. I get the benefit of the strong root system, so I am going to be layering, layering, layering with conifers. I mean, with uh, uh, trident maples and Japanese maples, especially, but beech also. Um, and then one of the great things I learned from Telperion, uh, especially from Gary, was that. They would have massive shimpaku out in the field, and I would spend the entire day wiring one-year, one-and-a-half-year-old whips, and I could wire 350 in a day, I figured out. So I wired six <laughs> different trees over a week, and then I had six trees worth of air layers that could come off in subsequent years. Uh, and so then those could get cut off, and I could use the benefit. So if I break, if I cut a whip off, and I wire it, and I stick it in the soil... Most of those are going to die because I would have broken, I would have torn cambium, I would have caused too much damage. If I wire that on a tree, none of that dies. All of those will survive. So I wire it up. I don't want to give you too many secrets, but you wire up a big long whip off of a, a tree that's like in a five-gallon pot or in the ground. Wire that up. Wait a couple of years after the wire comes off, the tree recovers. That, that whip will have recovered, and then you can either do a cutting and stick it, or you could do an air layer if you really want to ensure that that, that comes off well. And so, yeah, we're creating, I'm creating hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of plants off of my junipers and then eventually off of my maples. You know, so pines are a little bit different game, I think. You have to be a little more precise with pines. You can air layer pines, but you have to be a little bit more precise with those, but definitely the other. Well, one point for those who are uh, unfamiliar with air layering is that you can get a superior root system in many, many cases, uh, with the exception of maybe the uh, the real skinny things uh, that we're talking about, like uh, uh, like the juniper whips or whatever, sometimes you just get a few roots out. But if you have a, a you know a two inch maple trunk or something that you're air layering or something significant that you're ground layering, you can often get a, a superb uh, nabari that get, gets you the takigari flare and all that stuff that we might want, especially for deciduous trees, um, is 
really the best way to get a root system of that nature. And, and one of the most genius things that I think Gary and Chris Kirk and Telperion Farms did was they put that air layer on a geodisc. So they took a piece of felt or just some type of bottom where the roots would grow out rather than down. And they put that in an Anderson flat or they put it in a bag in the ground. And I've repotted probably 20 or 30 maples that I have from uh, uh, Telperion Farms. And all of them have these amazing bases, amazing nabari, amazing techie agari, where you get this nice flare. And it's from taking that air layer, you get a good start. You put it in a container that's going to facilitate uh, horizontal root growth first before it goes down. And that just sets you up for success. Then you put it in a container, you grow it hard, and the nabari almost generates and makes itself. And you know. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's another thing is that if you do the air layer and you do what Andrew's talking about here, you can greatly minimize some of the labor-intensive techniques that we're familiar with in creating good nabaris, such as approach grafting uh, roots. Um, uh, so the, Gary, you know, we're going to talk a, a bit about Gary Wood here. Uh, <laughs> so Gary was uh, on a team at Telperian Farms, and he had some wizardry. Um, one of them being this this idea of, of this false bottom. Now, a false bottom, a tile, it's not a you know it's not a new idea, but his use of this uh, this fabric was was somewhat new in how he used it. He wanted to use it to create uh, a nabari, and he didn't want to create a nabari using large roots, which is very typical. You have you know a board or something underneath, and you arrange the roots with with nails and. That's a good technique if you have an old tree. That's about all you can do, and you might even do some grafting or whatnot. But Gary had a different idea. You start with an air layer, use all the fine roots, the really, really fine roots that come out of there, and his idea was that you make those fine annual roots into perennial roots. The fine roots are the fusible roots, was his idea. And you end up with a nabari with less labor and a lot more fusing than if you use, you're using an older tree with, uh, with more complicated techniques. Yeah, you'd ask about how many air layers per trees. Uh, there was one guy in Japan I was talking with how he does the growing, and it was Onuma. He chided me for every branch I ever cut off a tree. No, every sacrifice branch is an air layer, and then you propagate more. <laughs> and he did this on his pines, junipers, uh, hibiscus, like everything on the property. There was not a sacrifice branch that didn't have a bag at the base of it for next year's batch. Yeah. So two comments. I joined the club in St. Louis. There was a guy named Jack Backus. And Jack Backus sowed seeds up until the day he died in <coughs> the 80s. And so one day I was real curious because a similar thought. I said, Jack, you're sowing seeds and you will never see them become bonsai. He goes, you've missed the whole point. It's a community. My trees will pass down regardless of whether it's a seed or a finished tree. And he had a much different long-term vision than just the trees on his benches for his own personal enjoyment. So that's one comment. And then the second comment... We have to repeat all these, you remember. <laughs> then the second comment is... I heard a professional give a presentation on trident maples. And he said, you really need to pay attention because not every trident is created equal. And if you look at the bud development, you will see buds that come out at right angles, buds that come out at obtuse angle, and buds that come out as acute angle. And he goes, if you take that right angle genetic, you will struggle with it for the length you have that tree. If you take an acute it will be much easier to complete the bonsai of your tree. And he said what Japan has done over centuries is they have down-selected the genetic material way beyond what we have done in the U.S. so far because our experience is so limited. So it really got me thinking that as a group in North America, we need to be more careful with what we're going to play with. And we need to look for the correct genetics that will aid us to get to the tree we want in the end. And it's something I never even considered, you know, 15 years ago when I started. So, you know, I've looked at every trident maple I've owned, and they are all different, unless I take a cutting of the preferred genetics.
So Jeff has made uh, two comments, uh, one being uh, that if you look at the bonsai community, we're all 20-year-olds. We can plant seeds and create air layers and whatnot, use the community as, uh, as our perpetuation uh, tool. <laughs> and the second being um, that if, uh, if you look at Trident Maple, uh, he was uh, commenting about a professional year to give a presentation uh, uh, and how the the buds come off of a trident maple uh, genetically dispos... <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they come off the trunk, let me try that again, at different angles. Some of them come off at right angles, some of them come, come off at acute angles. And uh, if you're not selecting accordingly, you can uh, end up railroading yourself uh, into a lot of lot of work trying to correct that. And that in the, uh, the West so far, we, uh, we're, we're not being as selective as, as possible. Uh, perhaps. Oh, we have a nice rainstorm. Did I get all that, Jeff? Is yeah. That it? Okay. yeah, specifically, uh, Jack Dacus of the St. Louis Club was starting seeds at 80 years old. And when asked why he was doing it, he was saying, yeah, it's not about me. It's that someone's going to be able to finish raising that. And that's the most enlightened answer to that question I've ever heard. When people ask me about growing stuff from scratch, I say, it doesn't matter how old you are because it's fun. It's very different techniques to work on a one-year-old, a five-year-old, a 15-year-old, or a 50-year-old. And a lot of those techniques on the young trees are a blast. It has never occurred to me that I might see the final product of any tree I've ever started. Even though I started right out of college, I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen to these trees. I do it because I enjoy working in all of these different stages of... Uh, development, but I might start stealing Jack's answer because it's so much more, I'm doing it for you. It's just, it's like, and, and Jack was extremely generous. He was, in, tons of stuff he was generous and he was very genuine. Yeah. I've also noticed over the years that a lot of the people growing, even into their retirement, they start growing. I find that they're often the most serious bonsai growers in general. And that a lot of the people, you might see one workshop playing with a little three-year-old they might have some of the best trees in the show because they too like doing those different kinds of work. And if you do think you can see the final product from what you start, send me a postcard. I'd love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's a, there's a back to basics uh, type of thing The question is, is there a back-to-basic uh, idea of people wanting to just kind of return to the fundamentals? Uh, I'll speak for myself. I find a seed anywhere in, uh, in my walk, and I have to put it in the dirt. I don't know what it is about it. <laughs> Do not send me seeds in the mail, because I will not resist putting them in the soil and, watch, and watching them come up. And I have thousands and thousands and thousands of seedlings coming up, and I can't resist that next putting that next seed in the ground. Uh, and to the, uh, the genetic diversity thing, um, I, I think that that's one of the weaknesses of the American system is that we, we're, not pro we're not propagating nice genetics, but I think the problem that we're having right now, and I'm speaking from a grower, is supply and demand. I can't propagate enough, I can't do enough cuttings of the amazing genetic that Chris had at Telperion because I just don't have enough of it. I can't propagate it because then I have to keep my propagation so that I can propagate more for next year, so that I can keep my propagation so I can... I just can't do enough. And if you talk to anyone in the circle that's growing, people we can't keep up with the demand that people want trident maples, and so I grow them from seed because that's all I have. You know, it's, I can buy hundreds of thousands of seeds. That's no problem. But to, like, it's, we, our, the growing industry is not big enough to, to fill the demand that, that we have to like have these amazing genetics. And that's why we need all of you, because you know, for bonsai professionals, we can't do it all. And uh, if you look at Japan, the, the bonsai amateurs are such an a integral part to the bonsai infrastructure and community. I just did a podcast with John Romano, who's a big shohin grower on the, the East Coast, and he said in the shohin world, they heavily rely on amateurs, just people who do this for fun, to supply the bonsai material. Ur Urshibata-san will go to different, you know, people's backyards and, and grab material and then take it to the next step. So we need people growing at all these different stages, doing all these different things to, to have a robust, healthy community. Any other questions? On the back there. 
So, I kind of have a couple. So, for fertilizer, uh, when you're growing nursery stock, when do you guys usually fertilize your plants? And if you're putting them into the ground, do you guys fertilize them while they're in the pots or while they're in the ground? Or how do you guys basically fertilize? How do we fertilize? Yeah, uh, let's ask a grower. Chris, what did you guys do at Telperion? To, to summarize the question yeah. and answer, uh, the question was, how do you fertilize? And Chris from Telperion, uh, there was a mention of the soil mix, which is a 20% composted fir, I mean 40% composted fir, 40% composted steer manure, and 20% aggregate uh, pumice. And uh, the fertilizer was injected every day, uh, a dilute miracle grow, right? Yeah, and so every watering is a dilute miracle grow fertilization. So if the tree's being watered, it's being fertilized. And so I think, yeah, I think the main point is that you have to sort of forget, well, okay, so thinking about the stage of development that the tree is in, so if you're trying to grow it, you're growing it hard in the ground, then you think more like a nursery industry or like your yard rather than like a bonsai where you're fertilizing extremely heavily, you're watering it more often, you're pushing the tree's growth. And then once it comes out of the ground, uh, then you can kind of make developments, uh, things like, am I trying to slow this down now or am I still trying to push it hard so I think yeah I think the thing that uh, to summarize the thing that you have to think about when you're developing trees especially if you're doing it in the ground is that you're fertilizing a lot more than you would your bonsai because you're trying to really trying to push that growth hard you're not putting it in the ground because you don't want it to grow fast <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a side note there uh, is that you'll probably 
discover that the smaller the container, so from ground to large container like an Anderson flat to a bonsai container, you'll find a ever-increasing level of stress if you have bad water quality. If you're growing in the ground, assuming, and we're talking about other things, assuming a reasonable uh, loose uh, soil, um, uh, you can have pretty good luck with pretty bad water. Uh, but uh, uh, but in, in a bonsai pot, especially small, you've ever smaller shohin, you can get really challenging uh, if your quality is bad. I'm talking about pH and hardness. Tell us. Tell us. Oh, I mean, this is just what a nursery usually does. They use, they add this nutrient in to make the bushes more compact. And um, I could see you doing that for maybe more full-grown bonsais or bonsais that you want more uh, buds to kind of be more compacted. Um, so I guess this would just go back to personal preference. So are there any plant? Are there any plant hormones or other substances you might put on the trees to actually inhibit growth? or promote growth density along the lines of what the nursery industry might do. To date, as far as I know, the bonsai industry has leaned on technique to do that rather than chemicals. I have a friend who's delivered to me his recipe, and he said, use with caution. <laughs> Works great on pines, but it kills azaleas, was I think the last thing he said before he rode off. And uh, so, I don't have any experience with that other than a, an undisclosed experiment that is underway. Yeah, I, no idea. I, I would love to hear more about if the nursery industry has used these substances on the same species that we develop to know if there's any way that we could benefit and take some shortcuts. So feel free to get in touch with any of us if you have Yeah, info. right. I think the marijuana folks uh, have been playing around with, toying around with... Uh, photo period and, and also day and night temperature, so they're switching it rather than higher temperature during the day, it's higher temperature at night. And they're getting very short internodes. Not that we're going to put our bonsai in a closet and <laughs> try that. I'm more interested in your chemical solution. <laughs> Other questions? Just yeah. to follow up on that, would, would chemical control be considered, I don't know, acceptable? You know, like everything about bonsai is about technique, right? It's about patience and time. It's the modern era. Never know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like if you put a tree in a show, like a can or something, and there's a note next to it, hey, I do this. <laughs> that would be like grafting. I don't know if you guys are picking this up, say. this question. Yeah, yeah so uh, so the question is, is are we going to get into some uh, fisticuffs over appropriate, yeah, the boundaries of appropriate technique if we use chemicals to shorten inner nodes and rather than using technique? It was a really interesting comment from Andy. Uh, I uh, and uh, uh, there's certainly a, uh, to me, that, that's a parallel uh, question or concern if you're concerned about what other people think <laughs> about what you do. Um, and given who's saying this, um, <laughs> I don't. But, uh, but many people in Japan uh, are divided into two communities. The smaller community is that which thinks that grafting is, is, uh, is not real bone sign. Um, interesting talk with uh, Joe Harris about this. His teacher uh, believed uh, that, uh, well, in fact, there were, there were benches there that had real bonsai and not real bonsai. So it's really interesting <laughs> to talk to Joe Harris about this. <laughs> Crafting is a no-no. The majority of uh, the people in Japan, more, majority of the professionals accept grafting as an appropriate technique and grafted trees win awards right, left, and sideways. So there's that. The chemical question is still out there. I want to hear that answered someday. I'm not going to try it. I'm just curious. <laughs> Asking for a friend. Well, a fertilizer is a growth regulator. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there you go. Exactly right. David DeGroat, thank you. <laughs> fertilizer is a growth regulator. Excellent. Sunlight, water, right. Yeah. <laughs> different fertilizers produce different growth. And and I, think, I think what he's talking about are, are um, uh, inhibitors that are used primarily on uh, foliage plants, on herbaceous uh, plant species. I don't. I don't know how that would work with 
Yeah, we, we, we need to have our friend Joe Harris here, who's a good bridge between the nursery world and the, the bonsai world. So, to be determined. Maybe we'll text him. Well, hey, we have... Oh, it's a little soft. We do have Chris's permission to put him on mic. So, awesome. stay tuned. Great. We have the technology. Great. Keep going. <laughs> uh, to the... To the chemical, what is acceptable question. There are some really interesting growers on the East Coast. Uh, there's a guy that's on Bee Nut. Uh, Curtis is his name. I can't remember his last name. But he's doing some really interesting techniques bridging the marijuana growers and pine growing. And just doing some crazy stuff. If you're on Bee Nut and you search for him, Curtis, I can't remember his last name. But you'll see him growing. And he's doing, uh, he's doing light deprivation. He's doing extended light. He's doing uh, all these crazy things, kelp. He's doing all this weird stuff that's like taking from what the marijuana industry knows and does to make really compact, high foliage, high bud back. And he's turning, converting that into pines. And so it's kind of like pushing the envelope of like, well, what's acceptable? But then you look at his end results and he has, you know, two and a half inch tall uh, azalea, I mean, brooms, uh, zelkova brooms that look like something in a Kokofu show, and they're like little bitty, but they're like so compact. So yeah, there's some interesting people that are pushing the envelope, I think, uh, doing some really, really fun work. John, are, John, uh, you used to do a lot of growing in a CO2 tent. Yeah, doing I'm that? doing uh, some growing on, I'm, I'm following his techniques and doing some, uh, some uh, chemical fertilizer stuff, and uh, I'm using a marijuana grow tent to grow some black pines. And the thing you see is that they, uh, the intense light they don't extend, and so they grow a lot more compact, and I have, you know, I might have 25 buds in the first two inches. They just grow dense, and so, you know, I think that that can cause problems because you have too much density, and then you have rolling, and you've got, you've got you know, you can't have too much selection, so you've got to be selecting, and then, uh, but yeah, I'm still kind of learning the technique myself. He def definitely does a lot better job, so look at his stuff. Don't follow what I do until you see some final product, but I'm really enjoying this, like, oh, yeah, taking this, what the other industries are doing and translating into how it can benefit us. Yeah, interesting. I think the uh, so the the controlled environment that he's doing is CO two injection, so that you're bumping the CO two up in a controlled tent. He's doing a long light period. He's actually growing year round. He believes you can grow for the first two and potentially three years without a winter, and so you I can get a year and a half to two years out of a twelve month cycle, and then I can repeat that again, so I can have a four year old tree out in a year and a half. Uh, that's pretty pretty typical to what I'm seeing my results being at. But the problem is once I get that out of the grow tent, out of the chemicals, and out of the light, then it just becomes a, a tree in the ground. And so I don't think that, that, that you can necessarily translate that into... That's what they're, I mean, they're doing that in Medford. I mean, my neighbors are selling off their acres of property, and people are, they're not even growing the weed or the hemp in fields. They're building buildings. Right, right. They're stacking them. Yep, yep, yep. So... Right. Yeah, so I, I think that you could probably do that. Um, it, it would just take the infrastructure to, to like be able to do these techniques uh, in a, and you know then you add cost and then it's like okay if I grow a tree outside and the the rain it gets rained on and not to water and it gets fertilized lightly and it grows for a longer period of time you know really save a lot of time by pushing it back from four years to a year and a half. You know, then you have to like start doing some math on on the money. But I think on a small scale, he's growing in a bedroom. I'm growing in two ten by ten tents, and so on a small scale, you know, I can I can make the numbers work. I got a question here. Ah, you're right behind the mic. Yeah, right yeah, <laughs> so when when we're applying these acceleration techniques, basically whether conventional field growing or growing, you know, with grow lights um, and injection and everything, but really ramp it up fast. What degree, if any, are we still using reduction techniques to kind of increase the density of the tree? Like, um, we could just pinch the candle back, uh, you know, half an inch every year to 
reliably get a branch or inner node there, but does that defeat the purpose um, at that point, or do we rely entirely on backbutting or needle buds? This is a great question. And one of the brainstorms, uh, many times brainstormed by Gary Wood, who sadly couldn't make it here, um, but uh, who has a, a deep knowledge of physiology. And one thing that he played with is to kind of toy with the plant a little bit. <laughs> so if he was growing a plant in the ground, let's say it was a black pine, uh, he'd let an extension run so that you could, you could develop the girth that you're after for early stage development as well as a strong root system. And at the same time, he was interested in creating buds low, which is sort of a contradiction. I mean, it's hard to do that. And so what he did was thinking about this a different way rather than cutting something off he would pull all kinds of needles up there and just leave this tiny little tuft of needles up there. And the easiest way for a plant to respond to leaf loss, needle loss, which is essentially sugar loss, is to push a bud. And where is it going to push the bud? It's going to, it's going to push them lower. Uh, so he was able to push out buds at Telperian Farm on a black pine through bark, which you can't do in a pot, really, even if you're pulling. Uh, needles, but you have so much energy to play with. Going off what Andrew was saying earlier about this this black pine cutting over here, which, <laughs> which is an old tree um, from Delbury. But anyway, uh, that that's an idea how we can we can kind of play with the plant doing two things at once um, by by uh, letting a sacrifice run. We might want to talk a little more about sacrifices and how we use sacrifices, maybe in just a minute. But 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 think about a sacrifice as, as sort of this volumetric thing. It, 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 it is exponential. I mean, every year you're going to kind of double or treble the size of this this uh, this cylinder that you have. And I, I've forgotten the math, but I, you know, it, it, if you double the, the cylinder, it quadruples the volume. Is that right? For you math people, let me know. <laughs> In any event, you're creating larger pathways for fluid. Um, and when, you, when, when you're building a plant like that, you're building potential. So when you start pulling an awful lot of needles off of this, it's like a hailstorm. It's like a, a ponderosa pine in the Rockies, uh, which after a hailstorm, they produce an unbelievable amount of buds. And the black pine will do the same thing. So Gary was putting three and eight together, and he came up with a technique where they were able to use the, ex the extension, the sacrifice branch, cut it off at about the time uh, or several months before they dug it out of the ground, and you'd end up with a tree that had all kinds of lower buds down there and you didn't have to do as much grafting. Just using physiology to kind of tweak the plant in a different direction. I thought that was genius. Really, really interesting stuff. I think uh, along those lines, I, I have seen it happen in a pot too, out of the ground. Strong tree, energy built up, cut them back hard, have, whatever you want to call them, sacrifices, branches, or just branches that were left to get too long for whatever reason, but I think it can happen out of the ground too, on old bark, out of the bases of branches that are old, close in on the trunk, and in some cases you don't ever need to graft those trees if you know how to heal wounds and know how to work with, uh, make the most of the good things you do have on any given tree. So it's case by case though, like anything. Yeah, yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about sacrifices. Uh, I don't know if that's a wrap-up conversation or not, but we haven't talked much about that, about how yeah. we, can, we, can, we can create problems for ourselves if we're not careful. Well, what I was going to ask you all is in the last half hour before the lunch break, we have time to either go through some of the core techniques for what we do with trees after they come out of the ground, or we could go over a lot of just odds and ends tips that might be species specific that could provide shortcuts for getting us to where we want to go with our trees. And I'm curious, do either of those directions sound more productive than the other? They're not awake. Yes. We can see whatever we want. <laughs> awesome. Maybe, maybe I'll start and other people can pick up. Uh, I think one thing that, that I learned when I was a, a toddler was that you, 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 you grow out your sacrifice from the bottom and you, because you're trying to create taper at the same time as doing all kinds of other things. The problem that I uh, discovered uh, uh, after a few decades of doing that is that you end up creating some pretty, pretty large wounds at the, at the base. So um, I think it's a, 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 
the, the general technique is uh, applied a bit better if you grow your sacrifice uh, uh, further up the trunk, and then you begin to switch out your, uh, your, your leader. Um, the only way that I think it's helpful to grow a low sacrifice branch is, is if you're going to use part of that branch in the structure. So in other words, you're not cutting it back and creating a large wound on the trunk. You're actually hiding the wound on the branch itself. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to start this conversation that way, but with an observation or two. Yeah, and that leads to a good point that for sacrifice branches, there's different methods and different ways. And, and you can use a sacrifice branch to create a trunk line. You can use a sacrifice branch to create a primary branch, a secondary branch. And uh, they're often all right and needed. Um, something that we see a lot with field growing is field growing, you grow the trunk. But what happens with the primary branching and the secondary branching? Even if you get this thing out of the ground and you have a really big trunk, there's still more growing to do. Um, you could have a trunk that's it's great, it's the size of my waist, it's, it's huge. Uh, but you could, if, if you have a big trunk, that means you need big branches. Uh, and so that's going to require sacrifice branches, and that's where, whether it's in the ground we're using them to grow a trunk, or when it comes out of the ground we're using them to grow structure, they're, they're highly needed. A mistake we often make with, with uh, field-grown trees is we, we have really big trunks with really thin branching. And so building that intermediate material you know these things are growing so hard in the ground once they come out we need to, to take the time to build that transition material before we start creating refinement uh, and that's a skip that a lot of us tend to, to skip but a sacrifice branch is a good way to do that I think uh, those are all some good points I think the a lot of the telparian trees that maybe were were not cut back soon enough or left in maybe a little bit too long like they come out with some pretty heavy, sac you want to call them sacrifice branches, they're usually more often than not heavier than usual. So, like I was talking about earlier, you have to start with getting them out of the ground. If it's in a root bag, you need to assess the roots first. That's the first pretty obvious step. And then you get this tree strong, and then you start to think about the front and sacrifice branches and things like that with what options you have. And like, like Andrew said, different reasons. Like you're trying to thicken a branch, you might leave one for one season and cut it back the next year and start to transition that energy to to closer in to try to create some of that potential back budding, whether it's in the ground or in a pot, or if you have smaller branches close in, I think that's a great problem to have as long as they're in great, good locations coming out of the ground, because those don't, you can still speed things up in a pot and still black pine, for example, are pretty strong growing and vigorous, so I don't think you're going to have the problem of uh, that being a problem. I'd, I'd rather have that than be smaller coming. If, if we did all these things correctly, they would be well, it depends on how long you grow them, how much you develop them in the ground. Like in Japan, you see trees coming out of the ground, maybe in and out, but they look almost like finished trees. So here, we haven't really seen that yet. So that's what we're trying to kind of get to more of that level. But I'd, I think uh, you'd rather start with a thinner, younger branch that's, that has already something on it besides all the way at the tip. And then sometimes they can still create that back budding if you, you know, do it in stages and give them a chance and some time. And you may be surprised with some of them. And, stubborn Oregonian goal is to do this with Douglas fir. And Douglas fir um, is notorious for dropping its lower branches um, if, or its apical dominance, basically. Is there any benefit still to growing a big sacrificial leader with a Douglas fir, or is with a species that apically dominant, is it going to be better just to contain or grow it from the start and never let it run away with the sacrifice? I'll, I'll, I'll attack that one. Okay, so the question was uh, specifically with Douglas fir, but I think this refers to a lot of species. Um, is there beneficial for letting sacrificial branches run and versus just working working at them slowly? And I think I think we've circled around this drain a few times, uh, and so I think I would I, I'll address the the branch sacrifice. Um, and so I think that when we see sacrificial sacrificial stuff, a lot of times on there's some I'm looking at in the crowd here, some tall ones that are coming off of the top of the tree. So, so if we think about what the tree wants to do, obviously it wants to, grow, it wants to grow tall and it wants to grow out wide. And a lot of species especially will only have foliage out at the tips. And so, we're, so typically what we would do, the technique that, that I've seen done in a, in a lot of people's yards, is that you have to work to develop something close to the trunk. So you have... You have buds in there. You have branches in there. You've got something close to the trunk. And then the last bud in that grouping, you let go long. And you, 
you let it go so that it can thicken up the trunk, I mean, thicken up the branch right next to the trunk. But you have to work to keep that stuff that's in there alive in there. So you can do this. Some things like Douglas fir are harder. Some things are easier. You may not need to do that with a trident, but but you you would be doing yourself a huge disservice to have every branch running five feet long if there's nothing inside of there. So typically you would work to develop what's inside of there and then let one of the 20 go. Tell people to look at my shore pine as an example. Of yeah, that. look at the shore pine on the table behind you all as an example on your way out to lunch. I let it get too long. I didn't yeah. Do enough maintenance on the outer parts and it got too leggy and I had to cut it back really hard now it looks, looks like crap again until I get some <laughs> right so then that's either going to require some grafting in there or if yeah. it's deciduous you've got to cut and hope that you get buds in there so the ideal would be to have you know some tight branching uh, you know a pad if you will close to the trunk and then one of the one of the runners of that pad go and then you may cut that one off and let another one run and go, but you, you're always trying to maintain the foliage close into the trunk. Yeah, one of the, the best things that Gary Wood ever taught me about sacrifice branches is that if you're going to use them, you know, we tend to not just use one, we use multiple to create our effect. You know, multiple will create taper for us. Um, when you're growing multiple rounds of sacrifice branches, plan your next one ahead of time. So you have one growing out have one set up for when you cut it back so you're not cutting it back to you know you're not cutting a ten uh, a six foot long branch back to a six inch branch have one built up with some energy and some momentum so that when you do cut it back it can take off and uh continue the the, the momentum and the forward progress that it, that it has yeah otherwise you pretty much can lose a year growth before that one will will take up no, no question there yeah going back to Doug for regarding apical dominance, the feeding apical, apical dominance, keeping them lower growth while we're using sacrifice branches. So Doug first part of Dinatia, <clears throat> all the pines get poodled when they, when we do sacrificial growth, we poodle them, right? We strip the outer growth, we erode the outer growth, and then we keep the inner growth. Can you do that with anything outside of pine? Do other members of Dinatia follow that? Can you do that with, uh, you know, Cypress family? I, I know I asked you this once, uh, Andrew, with deciduous. I don't know that anyone's done enough intentional growing with Doug Fur to have an answer. I don't even know of anyone who's done this. If we look at how they grow, I don't see why it wouldn't work, but I will say that that is an exceedingly challenging thing to start with from scratch. And there's a reason that those are often grown from the collected material. And they, even as collected material, remain one of the more challenging species because of the inner node size, and at best we're going to find some lumber or firewood at the base and a small enough bud to work with. And so I don't know that any of us can speak from experience, and it's just going to be hypothesized approaches kind of from here. And one of the fun things about bonsai is the more we learn, uh, the bigger our toolbox gets. And if, if we need a branch where we, we don't have one, there's lots of tricks like grafting, or, or other methods, this needle pulling thing that Gary did with the pines to, to get us there. So maybe we haven't figured them all out yet with, with Doug Fur yet, but at least, you know, if you need a branch where you don't have it, you can always graft. Yeah. And to follow up with what Vicky had asked for us to focus more on what happens when the trees come out of the ground, this has been almost an exclusively farm <laughs> as opposed to table discussion. Our focus for the super critique this afternoon will be hyper-focused on trees that are already out of the ground, and so the vast majority of our comments will be the two-table portion of the program, where we can focus on the different techniques that we might have for managing internode length, managing branch density, managing those last stylistic steps. Yes, Scott? I was going to mention that uh, Tom's going to do a special presentation of his technique for transitioning from the ground to pots tomorrow. So we'll have that Yes, and we pitched that one earlier. I'll happily pitch it again. We're going to be doing this exact topic in some of our talks during the demos tomorrow. Uh, we have a few more minutes before we wrap up for lunch. Who has specific questions on that transition from getting it from the field, doing an initial styling? Any any specific questions related to that? Yeah. We worry about nutrients in the soil when we plant it in the ground, and are we taking up any nutrients when we take out the plant? So if we worry about, like, you know, like nutrients in the soil, like nitrogen back in the soil at all, 
the question is, should we worry about uh, nutrient in the soil? And should we put anything back in the soil? I think the answer is no. I think, uh, especially if you're growing in a containerized, uh, like a bag or some sort, then, then it's kind of too separate. Uh, uh, earlier, Chris mentioned about Topirian. We don't use dirt in the bags. It's all a soilless mixture like you use, like the nursery industry uses. How do you approach root management in years when you're not pulling the trees out of the ground? Exactly. I didn't see you, by the way. Hi. Hi. The short answer is yes. There's all kinds of things you can do to manage the roots in those years when you're not growing. Or if you know someone who has been ground growing for a lot of years, there are a lot of techniques, very simply. The basic approaches would be the easy one. Do your shovel digs laterally to prevent things from running too big? And how close or far you are might depend on how big the trees are at that stage. I know other people, I guess the, to back up from there, most ground growers these days are building those modifications into the process. They're using bags, they're using raised beds, they're putting it on top of discs, or they're putting it on top of um, just landscape fabric. And so there's often a lot less of that pre-root cutting. The main reason we've done that in the past is because people didn't use soilless mixtures in the ground, they didn't use bags, they didn't use the discs as much. If you had lots of big, heavy, huge roots, or you know a grower, where things have just rooted in and everything's huge, that's not a crazy idea. And then you're on that same trade-off continuum where you're going to sacrifice speed by making those cuts to make it easier to dig. I'd say the better approach would be what John's talking about, dig the trees entirely up, make the cuts right where you want them, get the precise roots that you're going for, and then get it back into the ground after a year or two of monkeying with it. That seems to be the common approach these days. The, the other thing to think about with roots is um, if you're going for a traditional, really nice nabari, nice surface roots, good surface roots take as long to make as the rest of the tree, the trunk and the branching. And so when we, whenever we repot, you know, we only have that two-hour window that we're touching the roots to really make improvements. We can always prune and wire the top of the tree and play with that, you know. We have tons of days and months and, and years to play with that, but we only have that two hour window, really. You know, we can, we can set things up for success by putting it on disc and, and, and this and that. But whenever we're repotting, we, we have a very limited window to actually make improvements. And you can just repot a tree or you can repot a tree and improve the nabari when you work on it. And that's where with field growing, with, with the when you're getting a good beginning, it's, it's imperative to really make those fine-tuned adjustments if you, if you want that, that fine-tuned end result. Uh, question? Have you ever used like a rooting lower mode during those root plottings where you don't have as much root in a certain area and you try to encourage some new radial growth with a lower mode right there at the base? I haven't. Has, have any of you? Um, I, haven't, I haven't either. Uh, you, if you have some strength above, you're going to get some callus growth, and you'll you'll get a root. Uh, it, it's a it's an interesting question. It, it, possibly, if you cut a, a large root, I, I've never really used that technique uh, on the assumption that if it's in the root system, it kind of knows it's a root, uh, so it, it's going to produce a root down there. Um, if if you suspect you're going to have trouble creating a callus. Yeah, maybe, maybe you'd, you'd, you'd try that. But, but one thing you wouldn't give you any results is to sprinkle rooting hormone or a liquid or something around fine roots. That, that won't do anything. But just at anyway. the phase where the, you want the wabari growth, and that right where it starts to transition from trunk to root, um, and make a little section cut right there. And if there's a wound, that... That may be, now, now I think I'm understanding you. Yeah, that could have an effect of just as powerful as to pack some sphagnum moss in there, maybe at the same time, because where there's moisture, the roots will go. Yeah. yeah. So what mix would you use, like on a four-inch Anderson flat, taking the tree out of the ground? What mix would you use, considering all of the rain we get up here? Uh, Different. Good question, yeah. 
I'll, I'll tackle that first. What mix? The question is, what mix would you use coming out of the ground? We got a lot of rain here. Um, it de for me, it depends how much more root work if you have to do. Let's say you have a deciduous tree, and let's say that deciduous nabari uh, or sur the surface roots they need more work. Then that's going to be we're going to be washing that out and, re and doing very intense labor intensive work. So why would we use something expensive like akadama if we we're just going to blast it out and make improvements every two years? Uh, if the nabari, if we're happy with it, then yeah, maybe we put it in a pumice or akadama mixture. Uh, and then we can start building fine roots from there. Uh, if it's a conifer, then <laughs> it's a little bit of a different story, and I'll let, let a conifer person uh, kind of I don't that. live up here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, it, we, we do have a lot of moisture here. The, the thing to, to remember is even though we have a lot of moisture here, uh, in the wintertime, uh, roots, uh, they form a protective barrier. Is that right? I think you, you taught me that, Michael. That's what I remember hearing, yeah. So they can... Uh, often trees can stand in standing water when they're not growing in the, in the dormant season. I gotta I gotta point out though you gotta be careful with uh, especially black pine uh, when you talk about what soil to use. Whether no matter what stage it's in, uh, you don't want to use too much organic or hardly any in there because like trees can easily, especially weak ones, can die from getting overwatered in this climate. They can get really the, the needles will turn yellow usually first when they are getting too much water or not. During certain times of year, they don't photosynthesize as much, of course, so those are susceptible times of year, and when we get a lot of rain, if they're outdoors most of the time. I try to keep some of mine in greenhouses just to keep them drier. In the winter here, just like Ponderosa and Rocky Mountain June, not a greenhouse, a cold frame, so it stays cold enough, gets airflow still. Yes, Chris. I'll, I'll emphasize what you're saying. Is this working? Yep, yep. Okay. got to get close to it. So, <clears throat> our mixes in Tilburyan were specifically designed for the rainfall. We couldn't turn the rain off in the winter. We could irrigate more in the summer. So we intentionally had very porous mixes. And yep. for the trees that were coming out of the ground and going into an Anderson tray, the mix we used was 70% thomas, 20% bark mulch, and 10% pure manure. Um, and if we had to water twice a day, then we did. But you know, you just can't turn the rain off in the winter. And root rot in Oregon one of the or if you want to refine your approach along the way, start with one mix, and if it's staying too wet, use larger particles and less organic and less akadama going forward. We, we use a, a mix in the sort of the back 40 of my growing grounds, which is a lot like what uh, Tilpurian used. We, we used even more pumice. There's about 80% pumice in the rest, the uh, bark steer manure that uh, was the uh, the ticket uh, that I got from the Tilpurian growing grounds, uh, and that works for a lot of different things, conifer and, and deciduous. Um, one thing that, that you might notice is uh, you, you can you can rot a root, root very easily on a trident maple in the growing season um, that uh, you'll find uh, doesn't rot quite so fast in the, in the dormant season, but you, you can cause trouble in any season. <laughs> so having a a mix that is related to your environment is a really, really good idea. Um, I was really interested to hear your, your comment about lava uh, and, and the health of the pines, uh, uh, and yet the root systems are a little different. And then Andrew found uh, down in Texas, right, so again, a different environment, but, but deciduous trees were not doing well in lava down there, is that right? Yeah, I always... Uh... I found with deciduous trees, I get better root systems without lava, and and, uh, and and I think the short answer is there's you can grow trees in a lot of things if, if your technique you and approach water. how you water is 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 key. Here's why lava is so important for in the end result when you have all the old bad soil out of there. Lava, I think, in different amounts is important for any bonsai we grow because it's the only component that doesn't actually break down completely. So there's better airflow in there the whole time, even at smaller percentages. Otherwise, you just got counterparts that are so soft they will both turn to very fine stuff that will have will cause roots to rot probably easier partly because of that sometimes I would imagine just things breaking down and lava having that in there it keeps more airflow in the roots which is good for most things and in, in my experience that I've noticed uh, in general as long as as long as the lava is from a good source which we all use a lot of the same lava and have for years and decades and Boone's taught people to use lava on anything for that amount of time, and 
haven't really uh, heard anything too bad from using lava in our soil mixes for the for any any type of tree we do. Like, but the point, the important thing is to use different percentages. And there's times when you don't need akadama and lava. Probably when you're just developing your tree, you can get by with pumice and bark and the the manure or sea soil or stuff like that. As long as you're thinking about the percentages, depending on what you're growing and where it's at. So. Yeah, I find for the trees I've grown, specifically pines or junipers that have been grown from Telperion or from Bonsai Northwest, the down in the Bay Area where it's very dry, we don't have too much rain, unfortunately, not our problem. And we interestingly have more fungus problems than you do because we lack the cold to kill it in winter or the heat to kill it in summer. So oddly, our dry climate is more prone to fungal pathogens in the roots, specifically. You all have the foliar pathogens. You guys can knock that out of the park. But in terms of what soil I use for the field-grown pines and junipers, and to some degree the deciduous, is it'll be a very high pumice mix is my go-to mix for those. And I've done zero akadama. I've done 10, 15% akadama. The only time I would go over maybe 20% akadama right out of the field is if I have a ton of fine roots that I can work with right away. But even then, I'm more likely to stick with those you know, higher 80% pumice mixes with just a little bit of something, and that's really to help with the fertilizer. And it depends on how you're fertilizing. You may or may not want the soil to hold on to the fertilizer. Akadama or mulch can do that for you, or straight pumice mix will not do that for you. So if you're doing all liquid all the time, like the Telperian approach, that was a perfect mixture or approach for both the container stuff that had come out of the ground, the pre-dug trees, as well as the stuff that was still in the ground. And so then you don't need as much that holds on to the fertilizer after it's into a container. If you do rely on that, then yeah, using a little bit of mulch or a little bit of akadama is fantastic. And if it's still too wet, just use a larger particle size. Easy to solve that one. I, I think the common theme, though, is volcanic soils. Pumice, lava, yeah, akadama, yeah. there's something yeah. magic about those soils. You'll see people in Japan who use 100% lava. They have great roots. They make great bonsai. You see people who use 100% akadama, they have great roots, they make great bonsai. You'll see people, we have trees in 100% pumice, they're great roots and great bonsai. So, perlite. Perlite. Perlite does it too. To, to all these points, uh, it, uh, we, we can't give formulas here. We each have our own, and, and, and we have slightly different techniques. And what I would say is that, is that if you have a systematic uh, approach... Um, if, if somebody is having success, follow exactly what they're doing, <laughs> and, and, and that can work. Or if you're having success, if, there you if, go. Yeah. Tell us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Other other questions before we wrap up our panel? Yeah. I have one. Uh, you're saying that the, the black pines you had that were growing in the volcanic, the, yeah. the volcanic rock had more coarse roots. What size particle was I using on the pines that had coarse roots? That's exactly right. So I was using unsifted pumice up to 5 sixteenths at the largest, down to about 1 sixteenth at the smallest. But overall, I found there was nothing to maintain moisture near the top half of the containers, and so the roots went straight down, and they just kept growing like crazy all up and down and throughout the pot. This year, after John and I discovered that, we, have, we started using smaller sifted scoria near the top, and or akadama just sprinkled on the top or in that top layer. So the grower in Japan, Onuma, uses very consistent, maybe 3 16 size particles throughout the pot, and they can he just gets it right out of the side of the mountain at that size. And so if I find a better source for smaller lava, I want to try doing more consistent approaches with the smaller part of this. There's a place here called... And he has it sifted down to that smaller size? I, I don't know. Well, I brought a truck. I might stop by on my way back. <laughs> <laughs> this is right by my house. It's by Matt's yeah. house, so yeah, I think that... I'll, I think it's I'll, red. I think it's just I'll red check lava. it out. It's probably unsifted, though. You probably have to do that yourself. Right. I, get my, I get my pumice from there, and i got to sift it. I end up with a lot of large, though, in the pumice. So. Yeah, and I've been to lava mines. Depending on what the mine is mining for, they're going to give you different sizes. And sometimes they try to sell every last piece. But I remember one of the mines I went to had a mountain of something just a bit smaller than we want. You can take as much as you want for free because they're trying to get rid of the stuff. It could be really wet right now, too. It would be really wet <laughs> right now. Stuff sitting outside, I Yeah, you. that's right. Yeah, mines don't cover their uh, tailings. <laughs> Does that help a little bit? Great. 
What, one more question. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about containers. And we know the end product, the ceramic, and we have kind of the, like, solve answer for growing in the field, which is the grow bag. Um, but I've heard different things about the container to develop the roots before going into the field and then the container um, coming out of the field. Obviously, Anderson flats being kind of popular, but in a limited range of sizes. Uh, like, what are your opinions on what the best container is before the field and after the field? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the question is, uh, what, what container do we use in between the field and the ceramic pot? Um, if you come to my garden, you're going to see um, the ceramic pot is, <laughs> is the container. Um, and, and again, it goes to what we were talking about earlier with how, what, what rate of growth do we want for this. Um, I put most of my field grown trees right into a ceramic pot for the first time because I have a big garden and I don't want things to get away from me. So if I put them in a ceramic pot, they're going to grow at their slowest rate of growth possible and they're on a bench, so they're going to go even slower. But that's where I'm going to have the most ultimate control uh, and I'm willing to, to take that. Um, I do have one field grown conifer and that's the, 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 the pine cutting uh, right here outside the tent. Uh, and that's in a plastic crate <laughs> of some type. Uh, and, and that works well. It's the shape of the pot. It's essentially the same dimensions or, or something. But uh, it tends to, I don't know, I think, I think those are creative options. I see a lot of the best Yamadori deciduous collectors in Croatia are using containers like that. But uh, yeah, I, I think it depends on what your goals are. If you still want to, you know, if, if, it, if you just have a stump and you're still growing more primary branching or something like that, then an Anderson flat or something like that is the perfect intermediary. Uh, and aeration is the common theme there. If, if you're not going right in a bonsai pot like Andrew with many of his plants, and many of his plants are deciduous so he can wash off a lot of uh, soil that he might not want in a bonsai pot, if you are working on a tree that has a lot of development uh, still to do, uh, aeration is the common theme. So Anderson Flat has all these holes on the bottom. Uh, Colander has holes all throughout. Uh, uh, I would say a flower pot is a good idea, uh, also because there's a lot of um, evaporation through the through the Chris, wall. Chris. Custom wooden box. Yeah, wooden box. I haven't heard mention of this yet, um, but we use as much as possible a product called root maker pots. They're plastic pots that come in the same size as nursery pots, one gallon, three gallon, and so forth. But then the sides sort of step down like a pyramid and at each level there are air holes around the pot and so the roots will go down and hit those air holes and get air proof. Now, it wouldn't prevent the pots and the, the roots in the bottom of the pot but it would discourage them and you'd get much better rooting back up at the, up at the top of the pot. So um, if you google root maker pots you'd probably find a supply. And if you want a very quick criteria for why you might choose one kind of container or another, if it doesn't matter what pot you use, you use plastic because it's cheap. <laughs> if you're growing a species that relies on tons of fine roots in a small compact space and you can't fix the roots later via, via air layer, you're going to use a perforated pot. That's going to be a colander, a pond basket, a finophil, or any of the perforated options. It's kind of the only option for growing pines in containers if you need those fine roots. If you need control over the size of the pot, you're going to do a wood box because you can build the box whatever size. That's why they're so popular for collected material and why they're so popular for deciduous because we can get the low perspective we want. Your final option will be if you're going to be working on the tree and wiring it, then you're going to want a pot with some structure and that's where you have a gardener, flower pot, terracotta, high fired, or a training bonsai pot. So that's your basic guide for how you're going to be choosing which of those. I don't know how much of a difference that makes, but I just wanted to, like, the point about boxes is not only can you build them the size you need for the root ball when you know how much space you need for the tree, but then you can, you can have separation in there and you can let things breathe more, and the wood itself probably breathes pretty well, and then uh, probably more insulated too in the winter, also not as hot in the summer, it doesn't bake in the sun like those plastic dark pots do, so that's just a, maybe okay. something to keep in mind. And along those lines, if you have a perforated pot like an Anderson flat, don't set it on the ground because you just undid the whole benefit of your perforated pots. <laughs> Getting it up off the ground is going to make a huge difference. And if you don't believe me, put one of them on a mesh table and put one on a wood table, put one on the ground. And if you see the same roots in all three, 
Well, I won't eat my hat, but I will <laughs> happily publish a retraction on that. It makes an enormous <laughs> difference. Um, Eric Schrader, who's grown these things by the thousands, now is making sure that every single one of the plants growing in Anderson Flats are up on mesh tables, because if you're not, you're losing about 80 to 90 percent of the benefit of your perforated pots. Do we have, we, we we have time. We have time. We have very yeah lightning round. Yeah. Yes. Quick question. Quick answer. So when all do wooden boxes have applicability? When first gathered? When coming out of the ground? Prior to going into ceramic pot? When all can you use wooden boxes? The first two. Yeah, wood pots can be used at, any, you, you can do basic trunk development in a wood box, you can do it right out of the ground, you can do it whenever you need to do uh, a funny shape like you're doing something collective. So pretty much you can't go wrong with the wood boxes. Yeah, another lightning round. Not, not a question, but just wanted to say, um, when I floated, <coughs> I floated uh, Anderson flats over IKEA AstroTurf deck tiles. <laughs> and if you float them just at the right distance over the, over the, the tile of AstroTurf, it sends tons of roots down. Excellent. And there was one right there, yes. It was kind of on the same lines of uh, putting the Anderson flat on to like a bed of gravel or pumice or something aggregate so you're close to the ground still, but you, you have the aeration spaces that... Well, so when we're putting Anderson flats either up high or down low, we have one of two goals. Maximum growth in a relatively contained environment, let it root into something. If you want as much fine root development as possible, because you maybe have 50 small pines in it and you need fine roots, you're going to put it up higher in the air. So there's good reasons to do both, but be conscious about which result you're going to get from which approach. When are we going to regroup after? We are going to regroup, and uh, let's see, it is noon. Uh, we'll, we'll do lunch now. Um, if you brought something or go grab something, we will resume back here. Uh, we're slated for 1 o'clock. It might be more like 1.15 uh, because we want to give you time to eat, uh, visit with everybody, uh, chat with us. Uh, we're going to pick your brain about some of these questions that you asked us and uh, shop our vendors. So, uh, yeah, we'll meet back here around, let's say, 1.15. Where's the pavilion? Uh, uh, yeah, for the, the, the workshop this afternoon and for the super critique, please bring any field-grown trees if you have them. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. All right. See you in an hour and 15.